All right, so it's um, five minutes past three. So without further ado, I think I'm gonna introduce uh, Jeremy, who is gonna talk us about uh, merger impact on thermodynamical state of galaxy clusters mm -hmm. and growth of their central galaxies. So uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I have this recurring dream that I turn up to a meeting in a bathroom. And I guess today my dream comes true. Um, I'm sorry I cannot be there, but I'm glad that I can present the talk anyway. All right, so um, uh, I first want to start by uh, acknowledging the effort of my MPhil student, Arsen. Uh, this is just one of several projects that he's doing for his thesis. And the questions that I'm going to address today is uh, how do galaxy clusters and their central galaxies arrive at their observed physical states? And by that, I mean, how do, how do clusters arrive at, the, uh, at what we observe for the ICM thermodynamics? And uh, why do some central galaxies of clusters show extensive gas nebulae as well as star formation? <clears throat> okay, um, so for those of us doing cluster astrophysics, uh, we're interested in the physical set of clusters for several reasons, okay? If you're doing an X-ray survey for galaxy clusters, you tend to be biased towards clusters which have strong central X-ray peak emission. And these are thought to be dynamically relaxed clusters, as opposed to those without strong central peaks, which are thought to be dynamically disturbed, mm -hmm. as in the case of Puma. Now, by virtue of their strong X-ray radiation and cluster center, the gas is losing energy. And if this gas cools and forms stars, then cluster central galaxies will be much more massive than what we see them. Okay, so there must be a source of reheating, which today we recognize to be relativity jets produced by the Aegean in the central galaxies of clusters, which somehow couple their energy into the surrounding intracluster medium. Now, despite this strong, uh, and to this day, clusters remain our best laboratory in which to study uh, Aegean feedback processes. Now, despite this strong feedback, uh, some central galaxies, like in this cluster that I show here, uh, show extensive uh, multi-phase uh, gas, as indicated in the red color. Uh, these two pictures are to the same physical scale. And uh, they also show star formation. So each one of these blue dot is a star cluster. Okay? And the star clusters uh, in, in uh, the central galaxies of clusters are very different to those that we find in uh, um, these galaxies. For a start, they range in masses from the most massive open cluster in, uh, in, gal in spiral galaxies uh, to masses of about a million solar masses, though these are comparable to the masses of globular clusters. Furthermore, they have a mass function similar to globular clusters, as you can see here. Uh, in the case of uh, this particular central galaxy, we find, can find clusters from a few, so few million uh, years up to about one giga year at which point they're lost amongst the more numerous global clusters. So star clusters are forming continuously over time. And the less massive clusters will become disrupted and uh, grow the central galaxy in size. Okay, um, now why is it, uh, okay, sorry. Um, and um, uh, for those of us interested in gravitational lensing, uh, we're interested to know about the physical state of galaxy clusters because it's a starting point for constructing lens models for clusters. Uh, simple clusters, um, simple lens models for dynamically relaxed clusters as opposed to more complex ones for the uh, uh, disturbed clusters. Now, there are two ways for galaxy clusters to grow and evolve. One way is just by smoothly accreting from the intergalactic medium so that within some radius, uh, the cluster is more or less dynamically relaxed. The other way, of course, is to merge with other galaxy clusters uh, uh, during which the entire cluster is disrupted and strongly disturbed. Now, when you look at the, the thermodynamics of the intracluster medium, which is the best measure of the dynamical state of the cluster, even among clusters which are deemed to be dynamically relaxed, as this sample of cl uh, clusters from the CLASH program, which I'll describe in more detail next, um, you see that uh, the uh, electron density profiles, although increasing steeply towards the center, is, are not all the same, okay? And if you look at their temperatures, okay, then you see that some clusters show a strong central uh, decrease in temperature, the ones colored blue here, whereas the one colored red 
show more or less a constant uh, temperature profile across the cluster, okay? Despite all these clusters being classified as being relaxed. So the question I want to address today is why do clusters have different ICM thermodynamic profiles? And why do some clusters uh, host, uh, uh, have BCG's hosting star formation? Okay, so the data I'm gonna use comes from the CLASH survey, uh, which imaged uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, 25 massive clusters uh, over this redshift range, okay? From the new UV to the, from the UV to the near infrared. Uh, 20 of these clusters are assessed by the CLASH team as being dynamically relaxed based on pictures like this, where the X-rays look to be smooth and centrally peaked. Five of these clusters were chosen based on a high lensing magnification. Here's one example. And all five are clearly dynamically disturbed, caught in the midst of a merger. All right, because we have filters, uh, images from UV to near infrared, we can assess which one of the central galaxies are forming stars. So as sure here, I show you UV images of the 12 central galaxies, brightest cluster galaxies, BCGs, uh, which show star formation. So 12 of the 20 uh, clusters uh, assessed by the clash team as being dynamically relaxed, host star from the BCGs, whereas none of the five that make dis disturbed clusters. Uh, now, if you're wondering whether there's a dependence between seeing star formation and the mass of the cluster or the rate shift of the cluster, uh, the answer is no. So the blue dots here are those clusters hosting star from the BCGs. The reds are those uh, dynamically relaxed, uh, not hosting, uh, hosting uh, BCG without star formation, and the yellow sort of high, five uh, high lensing than the clusters. So you can see whether they host star formation or not, they uh, span more or less the same mass range in cluster mass range, as well as redshift range. Okay, so now um, um, all these clusters have been uh, imaged with Chandra, so we can derive um, the uh, uh, profiles of the ICM thermodynamics, okay? So here I show you um, uh, 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 in these two panels are the clusters deemed to be dynamically relaxed by the clash tip, okay? And you can see in the first panel, uh, clusters in which the temperature decreases quite strongly towards the center. Uh, in the middle panel where the temperature is more or less flat, among the dynamic disturbed sample, the temperature actually increases inwards, okay? Now, within each uh, panel, there is a scatter in a vertical scatter in the data points. And part of it is because, well, different clusters have different masses, therefore different temperatures, and clusters are seen at different redshifts, so you have also have to correct for the cosmology. And after you do that, this is what you get, okay? Uh, these are the dynamic relaxed sample showing a range in temperature profiles and the dynamic disturbed subsample. Now, you may think that I've divided the uh, dynamically uh, relaxed sample into these two panels, based on the temperature profiles, but actually no. What I've done is to group all those clusters we start from in BCGs in the left panel, the ones which are dynamic legs, but not showing, but with BCGs not showing star formation in this panel. So whether the BCGs show star formation or not, they know what the uh, surrounding ICM uh, uh, behaves. Okay, um, so let's look, um, turning now to the density profile, you can see that the clusters hosting star forming BCGs have more steeply increasing uh, densities compared to those uh, which uh, do not host star forming BCGs. And the dynamic relaxed clusters show the shallowest profile inward, so the strong, the least uh, centrally peaked in X rays. Now, if you look at the entropy in a relaxed environment, lowest entropy gas sinks to the center highest entropy gas rises to the top. And that's what you see uh, most clearly for the uh, star clusters with star farming BCGs, less so uh, for the uh, relaxed clusters without star farming BCGs. And in the case of the disturbed clusters, well, the entropy profiles are more or less flat. Looking at the pressure profiles, um, the uh, clusters with star farming BCGs have the highest pressures at the centers, compared to the, for example, the dynamic disturbed subsample. Now, this is not surprising. The disturbed clusters have strong non-thermal pressure support, presumably from turbulence. Uh, so you might suspect that the uh, uh, relaxed clusters um, uh, without star-forming BCGs 
might be those which have uh, intermediate uh, amount of uh, non-thermal pressure. Okay, and in fact, that's what uh, is happening here, as I will show next. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, quantify the degree of dynamic relaxation based on the best parameters that's been developed in the literature. Okay, so I'm going to want, use the one by Adam Mans, okay, which is based on three different parameters. Number one, how strongly peaked the central x rays is. Number two, how well the centers of the x ray isophotes are. Uh, coincide. So in this case, the centers coincide perfectly. In this case, not so well. And in this case, horribly. And the third parameter being symmetry, which is coincidence between the center of the X-ray isophote and the centroid of the X-rays as indicated by the blue cross. So here is perfect. Here it's not so good. And here again, it's horrible. Jeremy, a fourth... just a second. You have two more minutes. <laughs> okay. So a fourth parameter, which is commonly used, is the offset between the BCG and the ICM centroid. Okay, so I'll show you all four results here. Okay, so here is the peakiness, the alignment, and the symmetry. The blue dots are, again, the clusters hosting star forming BCGs. The rates are those assessed by the clash team to be relaxed, but not hosting star forming BCGs. And the yellows are the high lending clusters. And you can see immediately they separate out in this space. The, uh, the clusters hosting star forming BCGs are the most strongly, have the most strongly peaked X-rays. They are preferentially better aligned. Okay, and they also are, have higher symmetry. Okay, a sign that they are more dynamic relaxed. The cluster that seems to break this rule is this red one here, this red dot here, which lies in the same parameter space as the blue clusters. Okay, but uh, when you look at how well the um, BCG is centered on the X-ray centroid, well, you find that those the blue ones are better centered than the red or the yellow ones, and this cluster here, well. It's over here, all right? So when if you could plot in four-dimensional space, all these clusters would be well separated up. Okay, so what we have here is this. The clusters which host uh, star-forming BCGs uh, have, uh, are more relaxed, whereas those without star-forming BCGs are less relaxed, okay? And what must be happening here is that those which are relaxed, we must be seeing them long after their last major cluster merger. And it takes about a few giga years for a cluster to relax following a major merger, all right? Whereas those which have uh, less, um, uh, which are less well relaxed, well, the yellow ones, the high lengths in clusters, those, are, those we know are caught in the midst of a merger. And the red ones, which seem to be relaxed, but not as relaxed as the blue ones, those must be seen sometime after the last major cluster merger. Okay, so this is my light slide, which summarizes the results, okay? So when you see ICM profiles, which indicate that the cluster is strongly relaxed, okay? Um, that's when the X-rays is most strongly centrally peaked, and that's where the ICM cooling is strongest. And despite a good amount of reheating, there's enough residual cooling uh, to fuel star formation in the BCGs. You leave the cluster alone, it can uh, merge with another cluster, at which times the ICM becomes disrupted, Cooling is halted, no fueling or star formation. You leave the cluster alone, it starts to dynamically relax. It starts to cool again, uh, but the cooling is still not strong enough yet to fuel BCG star formation. So this explains the uh, uh, variety of ICM thermodynamic profiles that we see. And why is it that some clusters have BCGs few, uh, hosting star formation and others not? Okay, thank you. So we have time for questions. Any questions here in the room or uh, online? Yes, Elena. This is a very, yeah, my question, but why would the dynamically relaxed be more peaked in X-rays? Why would the dynamic relaxed be what? Sorry, I did not didn't hear you. In X-rays. More peaked in X-rays. Oh. Okay, so um, one way to understand that is from the um, uh, from the entropy profiles. Okay, so uh, low entropy gas, which is an entropy, um, uh, so low entropy, high, more dense, cooler gas sinks to the center, less dense, warmer gas rises to the top. Okay, and the X-ray intensity is proportional to most strongly dependent on density. Okay, so high density gas at the center, 
uh, you get strong X-ray picked profiles. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hi, Jeremy. It's the first box when I'll keep you here. So um, we have uh, uh, Jimenez Deja, myself, and some others have been doing some work on trying to verify if the cluster is, as you say, relaxed or not by looking, this is more related to JPEGs, looking at the ICL features, spectral features of the ICL, in particular, some enhancement around 4,500 angstroms. And uh, I think this could be actually probably better used without even the X-rays. If this is actually universal, we can with JPEGs and optical data alone, have an idea of the level of dynamical disruption of the cluster, and then look for what you just mentioned, if there is evidence for star formation in the BCG and vice versa. So I'm okay. just commenting this because you may find this interesting. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to see how well uh, ICL parameters correlate with the relaxation parameters from X-rays. Can you the papers? You can look at the, this last year's Jimenez Teja and all, or myself, Luke, you There's a couple okay. of examples. Okay, if you, if you wouldn't mind emailing me the references, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be uh, very interested to look at them. Thanks, Randall. All right, I think we have to move on to the next speaker. So let's thanks Jeremy one more time. Thank you. And so the next speaker is Natalia Villanova Rodriguez. Um, I guess you are there, Natalia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you share the screen, please? Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. So hi everybody, my name is Natalia Rodriguez. I am a PhD student at uh, the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And actually I am, a, I am part of the JPS Quasar ID group, but today I'm gonna talk about this different work, uh, which I'm doing in collaboration with Natalie, uh, my supervisor, Professor Raul and Antonio. And well, so, <clears throat> The idea is that we are studying the, the Halo Galaxy connection using machine learning uh, models. Uh, so basically what we want to do is to combine Halo properties and train a machine to predict some galaxy properties. And in this work, we are using the illustrious TNG 300 uh, simulation. So the Halo properties that we are using are the mass, the concentration, the age, the spin, and this environmental parameter, which is the over density in the in a three megaparsec scale. And we are going to combine them uh, to predict the galaxy stellar mass, color, specific star formation rate, and the galaxy radius. So in our first work, uh, we uh, compared the several machine learning models. Uh, so these two models here are decision tree based models. We also uh, tried the K nearest neighbor and the famous neural networks. And we run these models to do this prediction, this uh, mapping between the halo properties and the galaxy properties. But instead of using, choosing one of them, the, the one which is uh, performing the best, we decided to combine them. And uh, this is a very common strategy in machine learning. And this combination leads to a, a single uh, predictor in the end, which we call the stacked model. Okay. And so the first thing that you can look at is, the, is to compare the predicted values for each of the properties uh, versus the, the true values from the TNG catalog. So here is a stellar mass, this specific star formation rate, the color and the radius. Okay, and in this plot, we can uh, quantify uh, how good is this prediction, for example, with the, the Pearson correlation coefficient. And we see that by far the, the stellar mass is the easiest property to predict. And the other properties that do not present a tightly correlations uh, with the, the halo properties as the stellar mass do. And one interesting thing that we found in this work, which uh, happened to uh, other works in the literature that applies machine learning to do the halo galaxy connection, is that the, the models, they tend to, to overestimate the, the most frequent value. So here I'm showing, for example, the prediction, the distribution of the prediction of the predicted values for the color, but this happens uh, for all of the properties. And 
we see that these models, they are not recovering these less frequent values here. So in this first work, we address this problem as an imbalanced data set problem. So we apply the data augmentation technique that generates uh, artificial objects in these less uh, represented, uh, for these less represented values. And this should force the, the models to give more importance to these, um, to these underrepresented uh, values here. And this partially alleviates the problem. Okay, so uh, in the end, we have, with this first work, we have the, the raw models, which are trained in the original TNG catalog without augmentation, and the smoked models that are trained in, in this augmented version of the, of the data. And for both of them, we have the individual models and their combined versions, okay? Now, uh, oh yeah, and in this uh, first work, we also did this uh, additional analysis, the feature importance analysis, which is interesting to investigate what halo properties are more relevant when predicting uh, each of the galaxy properties. And also uh, we did this power spectrum analysis, but I won't have time to talk about this uh, in much detail. So now we are working on a follow-up of this first work. Um, where we are trying to solve that problem of not that inability to recover the, the overall distributions. And the thing is that the halo properties, they do not determine precisely the galaxy properties. So uh, we need a model that captures this scattering the halo galaxy connection. These uncertainties because you don't have perfect information to map between the, the halos and the galaxies. So instead of predicting single values, as we did in the previous work, now we are trying to predict distribution. So you have a set of halo properties and you're going to predict that the several values for the halo mass, for example, of its central galaxy. So have a distribution instead of a single value. And the way that we are doing this is with, is, uh, the, with this uh, very simple binning classification strategy. So the idea is that you have a continuous uh, variable here, for example, and now you define, uh, you bin this, this, this uh, you define beans in this, uh, of this variable here. So now uh, each of these uh, narrow intervals, the objects that have uh, the values in these narrow intervals of your property, it, now this becomes a class. So in the end, you did, we define here K beans, K classes, and the neural network, the output will be uh, this uh, K, K uh, classes here. And then, uh, so the neural networks, the neural network classifiers, they return a score, scores that add up to one. So they are often interpreted as probabilities, right? So in this way, we have a proxy for our probability distributions for the, the galaxy properties, okay? And this strategy uh, have already been used uh, for photometric redshift estimation with neural networks, for example. So, uh, so let me start to show the, the results. So these are the, some of the distributions in the TNG catalog. So here, for example, is the color mass diagram. Here uh, we have the, yes, this is stellar mass and this is color. So we can plot this joint distributions and I'm doing this for several properties. And this is what we obtain with our neural networks. So, here, actually, we are predicting uh, the univariate distributions independently. So the prediction, the neural network predictions are shown here in the marginal plots, these, these histograms here. And we see that the, the predicted value shown as uh, these black lines, they are in very good agreement with the true distributions, which is the shaded region here, okay? However, when you predict the univariate distributions independently, this does not guarantee that the joint distribution will be well reproduced. And that's what we see, for example, when we do the specific star formation rate versus color plot. So uh, here, yeah, so the galaxies in the red peak, uh, according to the, this neural network, they could have any values for specific star formation rate. So what we did is, uh, we proceed now by predicting directly the joint distribution. So now this, the, the strategy is, is pretty much the same. Now the output uh, will be scores associated to each one of these pixels in this diagram, right? So in this way, we can uh, uh, predict the properties jointly. 
And here is what we obtained. So it's uh, much more similar uh, with uh, TNG 300 now. And because now we are kind of telling the machine that there are no objects here, right? So it learns this, this correlation. Okay, and of course we can get the, the univariate distribution of the individual properties by marginalizing these plots. So this, this is what I'm showing now in the, the marginal plots here. Well, so that so the, these plots are for the, the complete test set, but we can explore, we can uh, investigate the, uh, these predictions. Um, uh, for example, looking at individual objects. So here I'm looking, uh, I'm showing three individual uh, halos, and this is the predictions for the uh, the color and and stellar mass of the hosted galaxy, central galaxy. So this one, uh, yeah, and the dashed line shows the true values from TNG 300. And so this one, this is a very massive halo and therefore, and, and which is hosting a red galaxy. And we see that the distribution for color is very narrow. So the machine, so it, it's easier to associate this red, uh, to, predict, to associate the, the color of the central galaxy to the host halo. Now for the bluer galaxies, we see that the scatter is much larger, right? And this galaxy is, is uh, this halo is hosting a, um, a galaxy which is kind of in the green valley. It's not in the, neither in the, 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 the blue or the red peak. And we see that, uh, sorry, just a second. That, Natalia, so, you have two more minutes. Okay. So we see that there is a very high degeneracy here in the prediction of the color. So this seems consistent to what we already know from the halo galaxy connection. And of course, so now with these distributions, uh, uh, we can, of course, we can uh, assign single values by sampling from this distribution, okay? And we can do this sampling several times. And yeah, and if we do several times, we can we kind of converge the maximum likelihood value, which would be which is in, in agreement with what we did in the previous work with the single point estimator. So, so the last uh, analysis that I'm gonna show is uh, the analysis of the power spectrum. We have a very large number of tracers that we are defining here in the color mass diagram. So now the thing is that this, with these two, uh, we have the flexibility to define the very large number of tracers because it's really covering all of the possible values, right? So uh, we computed the spectrum to each one of these populations. And we are using the whole box, the whole TNG box. So we, we are not you know, splitting them. So we, we are considering as error bars for the power spectrum, we are using this expression here. So uh, here's the result. So um, here I'm showing for each one of the tracers, which is labeled with the alpha, uh, I'm showing the, the spectrum and the residuals. And I'm comparing our neural network classifier and the two point estimators from the previous work, the row and the smoking. Now, for the neural network, as I said, we can uh, compute several catalogs. So as the, these purple lighter lines are the spectrum of several realizations, and the dashed purple line is the mean of the spectrum, okay? And we see that for these populations that the, the single point estimators cannot predict the, 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 the prediction of the spectrum with the neural network improves a lot. Right, but for the values closer to the peaks, it doesn't really make a difference uh, between the, the, the two methods. Finally, I'm finishing. Uh, yeah, so now we have like two sources of uncertainty that we are considering here. One comes from the, the error bars, the formula that I showed before, but we also have the uncertainty due to this uh, lack of information in the halo and galaxy properties, the, this math, okay? So, and we can compute the variance due to this error in the, this mapping by seeing the variance uh, of the several realizations of the neural network. So in this plot, I'm comparing uh, the error bars of the power spectrum with uh, this error. Actually, this is the related error due to the several neural network realizations, okay? And then we can see that, the, yeah, it contributes more for the population five here, which have only a few objects actually, but this is something, this is a way to quantify this uncertainty. Now, uh, just to conclude, um, uh, for future work, we are uh, optimizing this grid to being the properties because here I chose like 50 beams, which are kind of arbitrary choice and it's not optimal. 
okay? And with this strategy, we should be able to predict more galaxy properties jointly because here I'm showing just parallel or galaxy properties, but in principle, we can predict many of them jointly. And of course, well, there are already in the literature other types of neural networks that can that uh, returns probability distributions. We don't know the, the, this Bini strategy is one of the, the, the things that we can do. And, and we also plan, of course, to include satellites and apply this to other simulations. For example, dark matter on the simulations, we could use this to paint dark matter on the simulations with galaxies. And that's it, thank you. In, we, we have time for one question or maybe two quick questions. So, yes, please. Next. How we can go back uh, from the observed uh, galaxy distribution to the null properties? Sorry? Could you, could you? I mean, you show us how to go forward from the, from the simulated classes to the galaxies. Do you have ideas how to go back from the observed uh, galaxies? To the to the uh, this multi multi parameter space that you're considering. Sorry, uh, I can I can so so you show how to go uh, from your simulations to um, you know to the to the galaxies that we observe. So yes. could we go back like from uh, the galaxy we observe to the parameter space that you are sampling with your neural nets? I think that yeah was, sure uh, we yeah uh, yes we can do the other way around. We, we're doing this because in, yeah, in the beginning, uh, it made more sense to do this, but we can uh, use as input the galaxy properties and predict the distribution of the halo properties. It's mm -hmm. possible. Great. Um, I actually have a question myself. Uh, it's going to be quick. Uh, have you tested with uh, TNG 50, for example? Because I see that you're using TNG 300, uh, mm -hmm. in which uh, the particular size, like the size of the particle is pretty large, I'll say. And I saw that you were tracing uh, stellar masses or total masses of uh, 10 to the 8, 75 or something like that. Um, so my question will, will be something like, do you believe the star formation histories or rates for galaxies uh, as small as those in the TNG 300? Yeah, so I've, I, I ran on TNG 100, actually, not 50. And huh? yes, and we could recover these distributions. Uh, but I didn't run the whole pipeline. I just uh, checked if the, the distributions were well reproduced. So, All right. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think we should start. And let's move on to the next speaker, Eduardo Di Piano. Are you there? All right, perfect. So please, Eduardo, just, just start your talk whenever you're ready. So thank you very much. Um, so I gave a talk for the whole collaboration a few months ago. And then uh, some discussions ensue about, uh, about the contents I, I, I talked that day, especially a forecast on how well we could do uh, cluster uh, galaxy counts with JPS. So this talk here is a follow-up from those discussions. So, um, so uh, cosmology with galaxy cluster counts is summarizing this equation where we relate the number of clusters we can detect with uh, parameters that depend on cosmological parameters, such as the volume of uh, the universe we are sampling, and mostly uh, the, the mass function, which is closely related to the matter power spectrum. But uh, uh, with, with those uh, numbers, uh, typically we can constrain uh, the S8 parameter with a combination between sigma eight with the normalization of the matter power spectrum with the density of matter to a power, which depends on the tails of the survey, typically uh, 0 0.5. So it's more dependent on sigma eight. But uh, talking about uh, the observational side of uh, this kind of uh, study, uh, we don't observe the mass of the cluster, which is the thing that relates more directly to the mass function, but some observable which will depend on uh, which kind of survey we are talking about. So optical, Sunayev's objects, ray, et cetera. 
So, and the, uh, the mass of the relation enters this uh, relation here in a very important matter. Okay? So, the question we try to answer is how well can we do those cluster counts with JPS? And uh, what is the contribution we can give to the area in the light of current surveys, stage three surveys, and future stage four surveys? So, what is our place? Uh, among those surveys. So uh, I have here a, a, a plot that I took from the HSC site uh, with uh, several surveys in the space of the total area of the survey and the depthness. So JPEZ is here uh, in a place we are, we are going to be larger than most surveys. For instance, larger than kids, larger than DES, HSC, etc not larger than stage four, uh, LSST and Euclid. But uh, we are in the shallower side of things. So we are shallower than most of the surveys, not shallower than SDSS, of course. So this is our place in, in these uh, space parameters of surveys. So given our position, how can we do a contribution? And of course, uh, to be more fair, this plot should be a third, it should have a third axis, which is related uh, with the uh, photometric redshift precision, in which uh, our survey, as we know, is uh, very well placed. So, uh, from the 2016 paper from Begonia's Castle, which is one of the first contributions of the cluster uh, science work group of the JPES. We, we published this, this plot here, where we said, we made the point that because of the high precision of our photo Zs, uh, JPS can detect galaxy clusters down to lower mass limits than for instance, GES or L L LSST. Even though LSST will be very deep, uh, it's limited by the, the precision of the photometric redshift because it depends not so much on the depth anymore. So the depths appear here, uh, which it has a, a very high redshift limit, but because it's using only five broadbands, well, where we are using 10 times more narrow bands. So our resolution in the photometry, in the photometry space allows us uh, to go deeper in the mass function. Here we use five times to the 13 solar masses as a limit. So the, the, our argument, our, our main point of this paper is that it made JPEZ a competitive survey. So in this new plot here, uh, we have the total number of clusters uh, detected by those surveys. And uh, what we have here is that JPEZ will be competitive with, with LSST in terms of number of clusters all the way up to the redshift 0 0.8 and very close to Erosita and winning from Erosita after redshift 0.3. So it gives us the confidence that we were going to be a very strong uh, contributors to the cluster counts uh, among those surveys. Well, the problem is that uh, we need not only to detect cluster, as I show in the equation, but also constrain the mass observable relation. The, the method that most optical and SUNEVZW and X-ray cluster surveys uses uh, to calibrate the mass observable relation is to use stacked uh, weak gravitational lensing, as is a method with uh, a low bias and uh, very understandable and, sim and uh, able to simulate biases, that because mostly because they don't depend on the complex baryon physics. So it's a method used by several other surveys to calibrate the mass observable relation, even if the observable is not optical, uh, X-ray or SZ. Okay, so in the, in the talk I presented a few months ago, I showed this plot, which is a forecast on how well we could do the calibration. So this is uh, the uncertainty on the mass scale 
or how well we can measure the, 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 the mass of clusters using JPS. So I use this equation here from Weinberger 13 and uh, some characteristics of JPS we, we could got from mini JPS, for instance, that we have two galaxies per square arc minute as a effective length in density. And the conclusion was that we could uh, constrain the, the mass scale up to 5%, which means uh, in, in a beam of 0.5 redshift, and uh, the constraint sigma 8 is half of that. And if you can get three uh, redshift beams, sigma 8 could be in the range of 1.5 to 2%. So that's, that's a, a good result. But another result we got is that uh, there's almost no difference between those two lines. One is limiting our surveys in 10 times to the 14 solar masses, and the other one in 5 tenths times to the 13, which means that the clusters with mass less than 10 times to the 14 do not contribute significantly to that because the, 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 the number of new clusters we get uh, do yeah. not compensate the lower signal they brought because of their mass. So uh, there is not a lot of points including them in this analysis. It, which means that we lost that advantage I mentioned, the, that uh, we have so many clusters because we could go so deep in the mass function. So this is a, a, a plot uh, uh, of various um, probes of the, the gross structure of the universe, which constrains S8, which has to do with sigma 8 and omega m, as I mentioned. Uh, so, uh, Planck results, DEF three times two, uh, galaxy clustering, cosmic shear, galaxy galaxy lasing, and several of those uh, studies are here. We can see the small tension we have between Planck and the other other surveys. And in here, on the bottom of this panel, uh, the cluster counts. So we have SPT clusters, which is the bottom one. So the, the uh, dragon <laughs> mixed the, those two. And the DES year one result, which is this one, which is right now giving up a, a, a bit of a bad name for cluster counts because it's far off all the others. It's clearly a biased low for reasons I'm going to discuss soon. So if I could put the uh, JPS results on top of those, how, how, how it will be. So this is uh, what JPS would look like with 1.5% uh, error, okay? This is the size of the error bar, which is pretty nice, pretty good, but um, pretty good. But uh, of course we have this result when we have the full survey. And by that Eduardo, time- Eduardo, yes. just one second, you have two more minutes. Yeah, <laughs> that will be. Uh, so uh, uh, at that time, all the other surveys were going to be finished, even the Rosita if it resumes. So the lower Z cluster about students will be summarized, consolidated. So what will be the space for us? Okay. So uh, those considerations have to do only with uh, uh, statistical errors. If we include the systematics. This is a, a plot from the DS paper. We can see that in year one, they are already systematically dominated. So systematics is on top of the statistics. And uh, if we see most of the more important source of statistical errors has to do the, with the photo Z quality, photometric redshifts, line of sight projections and membership dilution. So photo Z enters in the calculation of the lens in critical density, which is here. And I did uh, some simulations uh, given uh, that uh, the odds of our weak lacing sample is 0 0.25 and we have sub percent levels of errors associated with that. So this is not a problem at all. Line of sight projections, this is a, a, a plot from Mateo's paper. Uh, Mateo's worked uh, with uh, kids uh, survey and he was very impressed with JFAS data on how well we could separate clusters in the redshift space. So here are two clusters which is, are just on top of each other 
one redshift 0.24, another one 0.36, and we could separate. And here is a counterexample where we mix uh, two clusters which are not in the same redshift. So uh, because of our photo Z, line of sight projections will be much smaller than on the surveys. And as well, membership dilution, which is uh, the contamination of the lensing sample by cluster members, okay? So we expect those uh, systematics to be much lower. From shear measurements, which is the other one, which is a big one and we can do something about, Leonardo just, uh, just, just uh, presented yesterday uh, a presentation showing that we can actually do very well, at least with mini JPS data. For JPCAM, because of the larger area, we are going to need much stiffer tests. For that, we hope that we can observe HSC areas. For instance, this is our, our footprint, and I prefer five uh, point stars. And Ectomap is really close here to mini JPS, and we hope that this area is going to be observed very soon in the survey, so we can calibrate our our uh, shear measurement methods and uh, cluster detection with this data. Uh, I hope we could hope we observe everything, but I think it would, wouldn't be possible. So, uh, continuing, we project that uh, our survey might not be the, 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 the one with the smallest error bar, but we think that we can get the less biased results. We can control systematics better than everything else, everybody else, okay? But what to do with this huge number of uh, low mass clusters that we are going to detect? Well, those are very interesting because models uh, still struggle to predict their, their abundances and the baryon physics uh, is much more relevant in this regime than uh, in the cluster regime. So, that's an area we can, we can make an, uh, a contribution. So my last two slides, thank you very much, sorry for that, is that I'm going to present the very first stacked weak lensing analysis using JPS data only, which is an effort by the JPS cluster lensing group in Sao Paulo. So galaxy shears were measured by Leonardo Vieira, which means we are, going, we are using those galaxies on top here and not these very good ones here from CFT lenses. So Leah uh, Dabrava detected clusters with uh, PZ wave and measure richness by based with uh, the new estimator that Alexis mentioned this morning. So those are the clusters and uh, the richnesses here. We are very dominated by the, the, the limit. And uh, with this limit of uh, richness three, we have uh, less than 5% contamination. And as you can see, most of the clusters, as usual, at the borders, which is another limitation of JPS data because with CFHT lens, we have a much larger area. So uh, with this data, we did, uh, Andrea did, uh, Vittorelli did a stacked weak lens analysis, which I show here. So first, we have to remove the very low redshift clusters because uh, their areas would uh, uh, go beyond our field. So we have this combination of clusters and background sources, and we have this result with the first lazy result with JPS only, okay? So these clusters in the very lower limit between three and five in richness have some uh, few times 10 to the 13 solar masses. This is a very low significance result, but we are very encouraged by that because the area is really small and those clusters are really uh, not very massive. And uh, for instance, in this uh, study that Leah and Alexis did, so those clusters we are talking about, which are the red ones, are in the, 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 the range between two and five, 10 times to 13 solar masses. So our lower limit of mass detection is even lower than we thought before. Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry for going beyond the time. All right. So I'm, I'm sorry we don't have time for questions. Uh, we have to move quickly to the next talk. Um, so where are you? <laughs> Please. OK, um, this is Alberto Toralba that is going to talk to us about um, looking for Lyman alpha meters in the JPAS pathfinder. So please.
when are you ready? Thank you. So, well, my name is Alberto Donalba and I'm doing my PC at Valencia. And I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, so, this doesn't work. So, as a brief introduction, uh, Lima alpha emitters are objects that emit Lima alpha, obviously. Uh, a very common uh, definition is uh, an object that emits uh, a Lima, Lima alpha line of finite equivalent within the rest frame of more than 30 angstroms. And uh, a typical Lyman alpha luminosity function looks like this, uh, where you can see the contributions of two populations. First is uh, uh, star forming galaxies, or galaxies that emit uh, a lot in the Lyman alpha, and the other contribution in the brightest end of the luminosity function are the QSOs. So I anticipate that in this work we are focusing more QSOs because the star forming galaxies are a bit uh, hard to see. Eduardo, could you mute yourself, please? <laughs> so the star forming galaxies, as I was saying, uh, are a little bit hard to see in, in JPAS, but we are going to focus on the QSOs. So in order to detect uh, the line alpha lines, uh, we impose some criteria, which is, uh, well, this is an example of finding a JPAS source, and this is a QSO at Redshift 3, uh, which we have selected the uh, narrow band, which is marked as Lyman alpha, because it has a single to noise rate around six. It has an excess, a flux excess over some continuum estimate uh, over a three sigma. And this success is compatible with a uh, lemma alpha line of <coughs> width uh, greater than 30 axioms. Uh, we also impose some other cuts, such as um, that the source doesn't have uh, proper motion significantly measured in Gaia. Uh, we check also for other lines, because if, um, apart from lemma alpha, we detect uh, secondary lines. We have to check that these lines are compatible with other QSO lines, such as mainly carbon four, but also carbon three, magnesium two, et cetera. And also some color cuts um, uh, just to discard very red galaxies, which are going to be contaminants. Uh, all of these cuts um, were extracted, ex extracted from some tests uh, done in, in mocks, which I, I will explain later. So uh, in case you were wondering, the continuum estimate, we, uh, we perform, in, uh, perform it just by stacking six narrowbands at each side of the, of the one of interest and just taking the average of them. Uh, and also we are correcting the bluest ones by the intergalactic medium absorption in order to have a better, uh, more accurate uh, estimation. And that's why, what we use in order to define the flux excess. So these are uh, some examples of selected sources. Uh, this, the three on the left are bad, bad ones, are contaminants, because uh, we are selecting, in uh, two of these cases, the carbon-4 line of QSOs as, uh, as lime alpha, because that's a very strong line. And in some uh, other cases, like this one in the middle, we are just selecting noise, uh, because uh, mostly in the first narrow bands, uh, we don't have enough uh, at the bluest wavelengths to compute the continuum, so it's more difficult that way, and uh, we are selecting just noise. And well, the other three are just good QSOs with uh, a very nice lime alpha line, and some of which we also even detect the carbon four and carbon three lines, so that's a good uh, uh, indicator that this is a good source. And well, in, in order to validate this method, uh, we need some mocks. Uh, mocks in which we have to put in three populations. The first are star forming galaxies with Lyman alpha emission, which I uh, already said that we are not going to see many of, of them, but we have to test it. Uh, the second is QSOs, and the third are galaxies uh, at low redshift. So for the first one, we have taken uh, almost 1,400 Lyman alpha emitters between redshift two and five from BUDS and BVDS, stack them all together. Uh, which is this uh, plot right there. And we fit that to the Brusel and Charlot models uh, of galaxy evolution. Uh, and with that, we obtain a space of parameters uh, with which we can interpolate these same models in order to have a sample of, uh, of spectra to recreate uh, the alignment of a luminosity function from the literature in order to test this, this method. Then for the QSOs, uh, I, I split it in two. The um, 
QSO, QSO is attractive to and below. I, I am using the QSO mock that Karina Queiroz uh, presented yesterday, so I'm not going into details with that. And for QSO is attractive to and beyond, uh, we need uh, to fit better the lemma alpha luminosity function. So we did um, pretty much uh, the same or some, something very similar. So taking the spectra from the SDSSDR16 and uh, fit them to a distribution in redshift in R band magnitude and also uh, a lima alpha luminosity function. In this case, I'm using the Spinoza et al. from the, the data of, of J. So this prior luminosity function that, I, that I'm using, of course, is going to affect the results. I will talk about this in uh, a future slide. Uh, and the third population are galaxies uh, at relative two and below, which are going to be essentially contaminants for our sample, uh, line emitters uh, such as O3, O2, uh, H beta, et cetera. Um, and I'm using a light cone mock, which was designed by Piero Villalba et al. Uh, initially for J plus, so I'm using the J plus version of those mocks in order to reproduce our um, our contaminants. So from these mocks, uh, we can build these 2D maps of corrections. I have made uh, one of them, one of those uh, for each interval in redshift and for the different fields that we have in mini J plus and also J -NEP. And each pixel of this map uh, contains this amount right there, uh, which is the expected number of, of uh, counts that we should have if our method would be 100% um, uh, accurate and complete, and divided by the actual number of candidates that we obtain if uh, we run our selection method to the to the mock, which are going to be some contaminants, some good lemma alpha meters, and also we are going some uh, to lose some good sources. So its uh, value there is the number that the correction that uh, we must use in order to include those sources in the luminosity function. This is an example of some sources in some relative interval in some field, whatever. So the result, the, res the final result uh, is something like this. This is the, lum the luminosity function that we measure for uh, relative between two and four. Uh, four is like the limit where we start losing a lot of, uh, where we start being uh, not so much pure. And uh, uh, there at the right, you can see the result of changing this prior luminosity function that we used to, to make the mocks. So if we take the same luminosity function, but we uh, multiply the number counts by some factor rho there, uh, we can see that the point that we obtain from the data of mini pass and JNEP uh, does not change very much inside of the error bars that we have and the purity uh, changes at most uh, like 30%, which uh, in this scale uh, is not going to be very important. Of course, this is important, but uh, we cannot do uh, a lot more uh, with the mini J's past data. Uh, when we have the many more square degrees, we will be able to uh, fit this better and uh, think which is a value that better uh, reproduces the, the real purity and be across matches, et cetera. So uh, in intervals of redshift, uh, this is the, the curves of, or of uh, completeness and, and purity. So um, the completeness obviously increases with, with the lime alpha luminosity. So mm, the more luminous is easier to, to, to retrieve. Um, and for the first uh, redshift um, intervals, we start be being very pure at uh, uh, luminosity, log luminosity 43.7, 44. Uh, also, of course, this is worse for the last luminosity, uh, sorry, redshift bins. And for the purity, it's more or less the same. Uh, it increases with, with uh, the luminosity, but in the first uh, redshift uh, bins, we have, uh, we see that uh, the purity drops uh, at some point, and uh, this is because uh, what I say, what I said before, that uh, we cannot do a very, um, a very accurate estimation of the continuum in the first 
uh, red shifts because we don't have enough filters at one side. Uh, so those very bright contaminants uh, uh, that are there are really um, just nearby galaxies that if we assume they are at relative two, they appear to be much uh, luminous. So um, these are the luminosity function for each redshift pin. Uh, we have made all of, mm, all of those with 169 candidates, all of them you know, with Lyman alpha luminosities, uh, almost all of them more than 43.5, although we have some, some points uh, below that, uh, just because of uh, uh, statistical uncertainties. And, uh, well, the, the average completeness for these candidates is roughly uh, 55 or 60 percent, so we have a lot of contaminants, of course, at brighter magnitudes, uh, sorry, at, at brighter luminosities we have less contamination. Uh, but with one square degree, we cannot go further in, in luminosity. We, again, with more data, we will be able to resolve uh, uh, the luminosity function further. And well, finally, just some conclusions. Uh, so integrating the luminosity function that we get, uh, we get this number uh, around 100 and something uh, Lyman alpha meters uh, per square degree uh, at luminosities greater than 43.5. Uh, of course, three orders of magnitude or uh, more in JPAS. <coughs> And with this, we conclude that we can prove, uh, prove the uh, Lyman alpha luminosity function with JPAS at <coughs> luminosities beyond beyond that, uh, which is, if you, we remember the first slide, uh, mostly QSOs. Um, and with the full JPAS area, or at least many square degrees, we will be able to reach, uh, to go up to luminosity 45 or something where we uh, are currently dominated by, by shot noise, basically. So, thank you. Perfect, perfect timing. Uh, we have time for questions, please. Hi, very nice. So, uh, do you have a plot for the distribution in redshift of these new candidates that you have found? Uh, well, not here. <laughs> But yeah, um, I mean, most of them are low redshift um, between uh, two and three something, and very few at the last pin, which we have very pure candidates. I don't know if they are actually good line parameters, but the period data we compute is very high. So that's why we have two points there, very nice. But any more questions? Here or online. I have a question here online. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we can hear you on a high pitch noise. Ooh. Better now? Yeah, it's better now. <laughs> Please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, very nice work. Um, I wanted to ask do you have or do you think you have uh, a few of uh, these objects uh, that are actually galaxies and not quasars? Have you thought about checking with the infrared data or something if some of them might be galaxies? Thank you. Yes, uh, I have not. Of course, there are some galaxy contaminants, mostly O2 and O3 lines. And, uh, it depends on the, on the redshift. Lyman alpha emitters that are actually galaxies, not, not quasars. Ah, ah, OK, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, well, it could be, but I don't know because uh, I, I haven't checked, I haven't done any cross match, so I don't know. It could, be. but for the moment, I, I cannot tell. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Good. All right, so I think we just stand the speaker up one more time. Must be an overhead. <laughs> <laughs> So the next speaker is Irene Pintos Cast. Um, he's going to talk us about cluster finder algorithm for D plus and D plus.
se ve, se ve. Ya, yeah, it's it something. Okay. That makes sense. Um, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you all. So I'm Irene Pintos Castro. I started working here at Texa a year ago, and was when I joined J Plus and J Plus Collaborations, more or less. And uh, well, I just started to work on a cluster, another cluster finder algorithm uh, for currently for J Plus, and we plan to apply it also to J Plus. So this work has been done in collaboration with Muhammad because he is the expert on Nuastro and we are using Nuastro. Uh, with Carlos because well he's my boss and he is the <laughs> <laughs> no, basically he he told me you have to do this cluster by now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you have to help me. <laughs> uh, and then Fran and Ted that uh, he or well both of them will be exploiting the, the catalogs to do their PhD and the postdoc science. Uh, okay, uh, so well, the reason that I want to find clusters is because I am interested in studying um, the galaxy's environment and how they evolve. Uh, so basically, um, a long time ago, uh, Dressler uh, found that uh, the topologies of galaxies dependent, uh, were dependent on the environment. Uh, defined as the galaxy uh, local galaxy density. So if you want to compute local galaxy density, you don't need to find clusters actually. But we now know that uh, um, the effect of environment is uh, actually dependent on how do you define how you define the environment. So it's uh, you can measure different physical mechanisms depending on uh, if you are taking into account the local galaxy density or here in more recent works. Oh, this yeah here with the halo with the mass of the whole halo or here from the distance to the center of the cluster uh, well we've been detecting clusters from a long ago uh, like more than 60 years ago with a bell sample uh, that is basically measuring over densities of galaxies in the sky but you can also detect clusters uh, by the hot gas uh, in X-rays or in the millimeters through the Sundjasilovic effect, and also more recently with weak lensing uh, through the imprint of these uh, convergence maps. Uh, so, as what we have is uh, white field and multiband imaging. This is perfect to detect clusters uh, through the galaxy population. So there's many methods. Uh, in the typical red sequence method, also measuring the presence of the brightest cluster galaxy. We also have here from the optimal filter of the Amico that is being used here in j -Pass. Also the wavelets that we had presentations before, friends of friends, so there's multiple options. And here we came with another approach just to measure over densities in 3D because Nuastro also has uh, 3D implementation. Uh, disclaimer, we are not experts on cluster fine algorithms, and this is just a work in progress. So any feedback you have, more than welcome. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, we are doing this with J+, which is great because we have a large area. Uh, you already know all these, the 12 filters. So uh, also it's important for our method, not only the area that um, we have the complete probability distribution, the probability uh, PDF. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay, first step, we have to build a cube because it's 3D. So, uh, right uh, ascension, declination, and the redshift. So, this is basically a tile in J, and for almost every source in there, we have the PDF of the galaxy, right? So we can just make a grid and start to uh, sum all the uh, probabilities of the different galaxies that uh, fall in that square. Uh, we do this for different redshifts and we have a cube. Uh, so far we are testing uh, this uh, redshift range from 0.05 to 
to around uh, 0.35. This is probably too far from J plus, but we want to know up to where uh, we can do this. Um, also, uh, so far, we are testing the steps in five, the equivalent to five megaparsecs, which means that we are actually interpolating to get this value. And uh, also, this is uh, something quite useful, and is that uh, we are including the astrometry uh, in the cubes. So when we uh, have a detection in this cube, we have the position of the in in, in the three in red deck and red shift two. Um, okay, uh, this was one cube, one the cube of one tile. But uh, you know that we have uh, large areas here, and we don't want to detect uh, clusters in the border. So what we can do, in fact, uh, we test it with this, that large area down there. And uh, we made mosaics because, well, there's a new implementation in New Astro with AST rope. Um, so we are testing this uh, large cube that is like, I don't think, like 10 degrees by 10 degrees, more or less. Uh, Actually, 10 degrees by 10 degrees in these 9,000 pixels times like 90,000 pixels. We are not not keeping that. Um, especially, I'm working with this laptop, so I cannot <laughs> manage that uh, size. So actually, when doing the AC wrap, you can just uh, reduce the like increase the pixel scale by a lot. So uh, I'm saving this in like 900 uh, pixels. Uh, okay, the other problem for this uh, that is more tricky is the projection effect. So at the lower redshift, we are uh, seeing actually uh, a smaller physical uh, scale than, than far away. So what, how we deal with this is trying to avoid somehow this, uh, basically uh, doing um, smaller cubes in redshift space on, on one side. And uh, also we keep the size of the pixel, um, which means that, yeah, for example, in numbers is much easier to explain. So at high redshift, we define that the, pix the size of the pixels is uh, 400 kiloparsec at that redshift, uh, which gives us that the size of the image of the cube is this size in pixels, and we just translate that. Uh, which gives us that at the lowest part in this cube, which is uh, around 0.15, the size of the pixel in physical scale is uh, 264 kiloparsecs. Uh, and yeah, you can see that this effect is worse as you go to lower regions, actually. So we probably need to do to do um, more thinner cubes in the low in the local universe. Uh, okay, so we have our cube. And the thing is that the cube, uh, most of the cube is uh, empty, actually, in its slice. Uh, and to, for new astro to work, because we want to extract things from noise, we need noise. Uh, so basically, we have here the histogram of the pixels we have in the whole cube. And uh, we, define, we find this peak, uh, basically with a sigma clipping standard deviation. And uh, we uh, give that value. Uh, to compute to increase the noise and give uh, poison noise to the rest, the pixels that were with a value of uh, zero. So now the signal is uh, there, but with noise around it. Uh, and finally, just we just run noisy cell in 3D. Uh, we are still like dealing with which are the best parameters. What we are seeing here, well. All is moving. Uh, this is the original signal we get. So all the um, redshifts, the probability density function. Here is after adding noise, and here is uh, the clusters that we are detecting uh, currently. Uh, it's moving through the cube in redshift, so it's sliced. It's a different redshift. Uh, maybe it's more clear here, right? So here we have the cube with all the the detections. Uh, this is Redshift, and you can uh, see there uh, all the classes we have. <laughs> uh, from that cube, we, we run a make catalog, and we extract like all the, the values for the clusters. And the values we are getting right now are these uh, right hand section declination, Redshift, 
uh, which is the slice, and the brightness, which is basically the sum of all these pixels. Uh, but also for each of the detections, we have an extra extension that gives us basically the, the value of the cluster in each uh, redshift. So you can see here that basically this is the peak of the, of the cluster. Uh, we did just yesterday a uh, comparison with red matter because we have a high overlap with them. And you can see here from the square, uh, the red squares, uh, it's red matter. So the large ones are the ones with more signal, the larger clusters, and we are kind of detecting them. But what was surprising to me is that with just the raw estimation of the redshift that we extract from our data cube, uh, we have a really good uh, comparison with the red map. Uh, so to sum up, uh, we build a large mosaic. Uh, with that, the cube, we add noise, we execute noise cell and then make catalog. Here are the three key steps, which are the object selection, because I didn't mention this, but actually currently I'm uh, only adding the prob probability that is uh, within a range to avoid uh, all this contamination. Uh, we are uh, also the, the pixel scale is uh, will depend a lot the structures we detect depending on that. So we will detect larger clusters with some pixel scale and smaller groups with another pixel scale. Also, well, the noise level and all the parameters related to noise cell that will uh, give us different signal to noise structures. And for the future, well, we want to define not only detect the clusters, but define which are the um, characteristics of these clusters, particularly membership, of course. Uh, we will apply this to mini j pass, which will be very useful because you already have a lot of uh, catalogs and we can compare ours to it. Uh, we need to find a catch name for our algorithm. And uh, I didn't have time to show you this, but uh, we think that it, with this methodology, it is possible to uh, somehow detect the filaments and the larger structures that are connecting the clusters. Perfect timing. Uh, yes. So, questions, please. Um, I see when, when you were comparing your, your candidates or your clusters with those from uh, Amico. Uh, I could see some coincidence, but I was a little surprised to see that the largest ones from Amico were not. Were it's actually, not Amico, it's Red Map. Sorry, Red Map. Red Map. Yeah. So, you have big circles, which I, I presume they are like massive groups in the top left, sorry, in the bottom left part of your. On the left panel? On the left panel? Here. Yeah. yeah. These are not marked by. Apparently, it is by red marker. That's that's disseminated. Maybe if, if I call correctly, Amico had more difficulties in actually identifying big clusters, which is something that large area because they get confused more easily. Mm -hmm. That happens with the similar analysis as well. Are you finding the same issues or or not really? Uh, so in do fact, you expect that you coincide on this on these more massive candidates. Or? Uh, could be because the thing is that uh, here it was kind of uh, the nightmare of this uh, mosaic because uh, this is a large structure. So depending on the signal the signal to noise or the noise that I add, all these are these individual uh, detections or just a large one. It's, huge. it's a huge structure that I'm seeing uh, just here and there's nothing in red Interesting. Uh, you have only this area analyzed, you don't have the full. I understand you just have analyzed this cube, right? You don't have the full. Well, I'm using this cube to test all the parameters. Uh, okay. And then, but so far it is quite automatic, so it should be just a, we should talk. a time. Yeah, we should look at the rest of it. <laughs> um, I think I saw someone raising his hand on the online. Yes, I did. Oh, all right. Yes. Please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Very nice talk. Um, I, I think I might not have understood something. So why don't your grid is fixed on physical size? It means that uh, you don't have this problem of the the, the differences in the areas uh, as far uh, when you go uh, deeper in redshift. Uh, yeah, that is a technical issue because if I keep the physical size, then pixels. So you have to imagine this as a cube. Yes. So the pixels have to be the same size. Yeah, but the, you, you can rebin. 
Yeah. And so this you is can go read beginning of your image. But uh, so the, the extraction is in 3D, not layer by, by layer. So if it was layer by layer, I could have different pixel size in each layer. But it's not a pixel, it's a voxel. And I'm detecting the voxels all together. So I cannot have different sizes in a layer and the contiguous layer. Mm. OK, thank you. So I think we should thank Irene uh, for Remember that if you have more questions, you can just catch up with her in the uh, coffee break. And the next speaker is uh, Andres Balaguera, uh, who I think must be online, right? Yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Uh, can you see my screen? Just take it away. Yes, yes. We can All see right. your screen. Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry for not being there. And thanks for, for giving me the chance to, to give this talk. So uh, I am going to show some uh, efforts that we are developing here at uh, the IAC uh, to generate uh, mock catalogs, uh, not only for JPAS, but uh, for a number of uh, uh, galaxy rated surveys. Uh, this is a work that has been developed uh, also with uh, Francisco Kitaura, Ginevra Favole, and PhD students uh, Francesco Sinigalia and, and uh, Rebelo de Almeida. So the outline uh, of the talk uh, is uh, very short. I'm going to 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 justify plans uh, for show plans for JPAS. So motivation, uh, which I will skip because I think we are motivated on the need of mock catalogs. Uh, I'm, I'm going to extend a bit on uh, tell, trying to explain what is BAM, some examples of the method of uh, uh, generating mock catalogs and the state of the work in terms of uh, mocks for JPAS. Uh, so basically what we want to do with our method is to provide a set of uh, light cones or snapshots of dark matter um, halos um, with positions, velocities, and intrinsic properties understood as uh, properties such as uh, virial masses or velocity dispersion, maximum circular velocities, spin, concentration, etc. Uh, on top of that, and using a link uh, to galaxy population, we want, would like to have uh, galaxy catalogs, quasar catalogs, and the key thing is that all these catalogs will have the same underlying dark matter density field. So this makes these catalogs suitable for multi-tracer analysis. So as I said before, the idea is to generate snapshots or light cones, which is something we are working on now, up to Redshift uh, 4. So there has been some um, version of these mocks uh, in the form of snapshots in 23 different uh, snapshots, uh, 1,000 mocks each snapshot already produced uh, by January, I think, or February this year. And I will come to this uh, uh, later on this, on this um, version. So the motivation, as I said before, I think we are, I, I can skip safely this slide because we are all convinced that we need mocks. So for, for uh, especially for large scale structure, given the amount of observables that we would like to have, two, three point statistics, abundances, lensing or assembly bias, whatever we need to measure will need uh, um, accurate mock catalogs. So let me, sorry, let me then pass to, to explain what, what BAM is. BAM stands for Bias Assignment Method. And it can be understood as a um, physically supervised machine learning approach in that uh, generating dark matter halo catalogs learning from a few number of um, uh, detailed and body simulations. So this already represents an advantage over uh, common approaches to large-scale structure with machine learning, which usually use um, hundreds, if not thousands, of simulations to learn from. So our method learns from can learn from a few simulations. Actually, uh, few the first applications we have done are uh, means uh, one or two simulations to learn from. And what do we learn from? We actually learn the bias and the connection between dark matter population and the underlying dark matter density fields in a purely statistical way in the sense and, and taking into account all possible contributions from the um, dark matter distribution, uh, meaning uh, local and local uh, properties such uh, taking into, into account, for instance, the tidal field or the invariance of the tidal field 
um, regions are collapsing. So this plot here basically represents or uh, tries to motivate what the bias in BAM is and how it changes according to different, in this case, different cosmic web types and how we can reconstruct to, to a very high accuracy, 1% in terms of power spectrum, the, the distribution of uh, dark matter halos. So what do we need? What is the, what are the steps that we need to produce a mock catalog? So basically, uh, the, the the procedure is divided in, in in four stages. We have a learning stage in which we calibrate some products, basically uh, something we call the by the, the BAM kernel and the bias. Then we pass to the production of uh, Halo mock catalogs. Uh, which are built uh, using the kernel and the bias applied on independent dark matter density fields generated with approximated methods. That's this. This is the reason why the the, the method is is fast, um, and 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 the method uh, basically corrects uh, with the kernel and the bias all possible inaccuracies and all these approximated methods might bring to the to the to the approach. Once number counts are generated, we need to assign phase space co uh, coordinates, meaning uh, velocities and, and, and physical coordinates to the halos. On top of that, we, we assign the dark matter halo properties. And once these are in place, we can use uh, an HOD analysis, an HOD approach, sorry, to, to generate galaxy mock catalogs. So all these steps represent a, 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 a great deal of work, and, and, and these are tricky steps. Uh, uh, especially the assignment of halo properties is, is very is very tricky. So what do we need uh, for BAM? We basically, as I said before, we need an approximated dark matter dense, uh, dark, um, dark matter solver or, or gravity solver that is going to evolve a set of initial conditions from a detailed embodied simulation, but with a very low resolution such that we do not basically replicate embodied simulation in terms of number of particles or, 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 or resolution. We, we downgrade our initial conditions uh, and we obtain an approximated dark matter density field at the redshift of interest. We also need the tracer catalog from the reference simulation with the same seed as initial conditions such that we can basically map the halos and the dark matter to build the, the, the halo bias. Uh, with these three ingredients, we basically perform what we called, I called before calibration and generation of of uh, uh, halo number count. So there is one recently published paper, at least in the archive, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have been uh, um, applying BAM to a mock challenge within the DESI collaboration. So in, in that case, we had uh, uh, simulation, a slick simulation, which is small for, for large scale structure analysis, 500 megaparsec site. And uh, there we, we, we learn how to map a halo distribution into in the independent dark matter density fields run with a Lagrangian perturbation theory. We applied uh, uh, our techniques to generate uh, halo um, properties, in this case, uh, viral mass and, and velocity dispersion. And basically, these plots try to summarize the results that we got there. So we basically see here power spectrum uh, of an ensemble of 80 BAM catalogs compared to the same number of reference and body simulation. You have real space in, 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 in relative space, quadru monopole, quadrupole, uh, exadecapole. And you see that we all we are getting very good results up to relative point four in terms, if you look at the ratio between the mean power spectrum. We also have the same quantity of two point statistics in, in configuration space. We have some some issues with the with the quadruple steel because we we are not perfect. We still have things to to fix there, and we have the the behavior of the covariance matrix for the power spectrum here, which basically makes it indistinguishable to the to the reference. We also have uh, uh, the assignment of properties, which um, uh, is a hierarchical approach in which we decide which of the halo uh, properties correlates the most with the underlying dark matter density field. So you can use like a person uh, approach uh, and, and generate uh, like a, a hierarchical scheme in which you assign one property and based on that property, you start to assign the rest of the properties. So you see how the abundance in terms of, in this case, mural masses and, abund and, and velocity dispersion behaves as a function of different cosmic web types. Sorry that I am running, but- uh, uh, Yes, I, I was gonna tell you, you 
<laughs> you had three more minutes, actually. I was going to tell you that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this is uh, just covariance matrices for power spectrum. This is just to make a uh, to 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 make the point that we are on the right direction because we are we can provide very accurate covariance matrices in power spectrum for different halo mass beams and 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 re in real and for in and Redshift space, which is uh, what every mock catalog should provide. Now, what what are, what are we standing for 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 JPAS? For JPAS, we would like to have. Uh, a larger reference simulation, which is the unit sim one gigaparsec, which is fixed sample to the initial conditions, which is much uh, is uh, better suited for our purposes. Uh, this is just an example of how we reconstruct with that simulation uh, the density field. This is halo number counts from the reference and the different approaches that we have in our uh, methods. This is power spectrum reconstruction, 1% up to Nyquist frequency at all redshifts that we have explored. And this is the same quantity, uh, this is the same uh, analysis for free point statistics, which is not calibrated in the method. So this relies on the amount of physical information that you put in your bias. That's why it might change from model to model. We also have the issue of the uh, halo property. So as I said before, the hierarch hierarchical approach basically relies on how uh, which of the halo properties real, uh, correlates the most with the underlying dark matter field. So in this case, we have maximum circular velocity, which is the one correlating the most at all redshifts. And on top of that, you start assigning, keeping track of the full link, uh, scalar relation with the mass, for instance, or spin in order to reproduce uh, uh, not only the abundance, but the scalar relations themselves. So this is what how it looks, reconstruction. This is the abundance in the different uh, halo properties. This is the ratio to the reference. So this is just a part of reconstruction that uh, checks that we have to do to make sure that our approach is working. And this is the how the scalar relations look like in the in reference in, in, in the mocks that we might produce, in this case, like a test. Now, as I said before, we have produced function uh, mock catalogs in uh, in 24, I wrote before 23, these 24 snapshots by the uh, beginning of this year. And this is a, a plot uh, summarizing the, the quality of those mocks. So the color lines is the reference, which being a uh, fixed amplitude can be understood as the mean of an ensemble. And uh, the, the gray lines are the, the thousand mock catalogs that we have uh, produced. So you can see that at, at all redshifts, we are getting a very accurate results in terms, uh, at least by eye, if you can see here, in terms of two-point statistics. Now, unfortunately, these mocks were not used, uh, but fortunately, they were not used because this was this happened at the beginning of the year. And uh, during the, the, the production of the decimal mocks, a lot of improvement have been done on the code and the, and the assessment of, uh, of halo properties. So new version will be delivered soon, I hope, with these new improvements included, uh, especially testing new approaches that we need to, to take into account to, to deliver uh, halo properties that not only account for the one-point statistics with respect to the reference, but also the, the, the shape of the power spectrum and the bias that you get, that you get from... from from the population when you divide uh, when you divide it in terms of any of the properties we are providing. So we are trying to be as uh, accurate as possible uh, and deliver mocks with all possible uh, with with high accuracy in one, two, three point statistics and their corresponding covariance matrices in all possible kind of uh, beaming uh, uh, halo properties uh, that you would like to. So I I leave with, leave you with this. Uh, a summary of the next steps and a summary of the references if you're interested or uh, all of us have tried to explain it's much more is is explained with a much uh, in much more detail there so thanks a lot for 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 the time the patient i have provided a lot of plots uh, but i had to rush sorry so thank you 13 minutes thank you andres i think we have time for two quick questions uh, Andres, I probably asked you this question, but uh, uh, sorry, I, I go here again. How long, how easy would be for you to produce actually light cones? Just to, because we need to uniformize you know, the output of the of the of the mocks, right? So uh, Piano has produced light cones from the Pinocchio mocks. It'd be ideal that you produce something that has similar format so that we can use both indistinctly. So yes, the 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 the, the issue here is that uh, we are. Um... With Paco Kitaura, we we are working on 
on a new approach to deliver directly light. So the, the, the standard approach might be to generate the snapshots and then put those snapshots into a light con generator, right? But we would like to, to generate uh, light cons directly from, from, from the code. And this is this has been uh, uh, done by, by, by Paco, as I said. Uh, he is uh, producing dark matter density fields on light cons and with using what we have already done with the, with the unit team, we can map in different redshift uh, bins or shells, the information of, of the halo bias and, and then produce directly the, the, the light cone without the need to, to do replications or, or and, and, and the consequences that all these might have in terms of uh, two point or three point statistics when, when you build your light cones from, a, from a snapshots. But of course, once we have the, 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 the snapshots, uh, basically, I mean, we can we can we can use Litecon generator, and of course, the other project might take it slightly longer. But uh, as I say, this is this is our our goal to directly produce those Litecons. Okay. Any more questions? Otherwise, let's thanks Andreas one more time. Thank you. Time for coffee. Yes. <laughs> what time do we come back? Sure. That's a question for the net. Uh, uh, <laughs> when do we come back again? Uh, because it's uh, ten minutes past. I guess. I guess five, right? All right. In twenty minutes. Okay. We come back in twenty minutes, guys. Right? Uh, bye. Let's start then this uh, last session of talks. Um. Okay, I'm biased, but we will finally start talking about stars. Okay. Uh, and we will start with uh, Paula Puello to be uh, telling us about the sensitivity of JPAS filters to elemental abundance in stars. Please, thank you. I'll let you know in when um, minutes. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am Paula. I work in the University of Sao Paulo, but I'm spending uh, one year here in CEFCA with uh, FAPESP funding. And uh, I would like to share with you the first part of the project that I'm developing here. Uh, it's work in progress, very preliminary, but I figured it was a good opportunity to broadcast the project to the collaboration and possibly get input. Um, one slide of context. My ultimate goal is to know how to use JPAS data to do archaeology of galaxies. And by archaeology of galaxies, I mean to use present day chemical abundances to trace the past history of these stellar systems. So archaeology is something that we do in our own galaxy, in the stellar clusters, in, uh, in other systems as well. And uh, well, as I mentioned, we needed the chemical abundances. Um, and when I mean chemical abundances, I am going beyond iron abundance or uh, total metallicity, I'm talking about uh, chemical ratios like alpha enhancement, which is uh, very used for uh, galaxies uh, to trace uh, star formation time scales and this kind of second order uh, detailing of the chemistry of a system. And uh, well, exactly because we needed to measure the chemical abundances, most of the studies use spectroscopy. Uh, but we have JPAS in this quasi-spectroscopy domain, and then I would like to understand to what extent we can push these studies, which are typically uh, spectroscopic, to the data that we have. There is, I would like to mention that there is at least one very beautiful case of using photometry to look at the variations of chemistry. This is not a work of mine, I'm just quoting from literature. Uh, Miloni and collaborators for several years they have been studying uh, stars in globular clusters and galactic <clears throat> ones, and they managed to find very smart combination of filters that split the stars of the globular clusters in two or more groups. And they split exactly because they have different chemistry, which means that they are different generations. So at least this is the kind of motivation. They are not exactly measuring the abundances, but this is the motivation that I'm uh, looking for. So let's try to do this with uh, J spectra, or at least um, uh, identify to what extent we can, we can do it. I'm starting here with stars, and uh, hopefully we will get so, also some results for stellar clusters 
uh, by the time that I finish the project here, the one year project. Before I speak uh, on exactly what I'm doing, I would like just to highlight that um, to some extent this has been, um, there are a few things that we know already from the data that we have. There is this very recent paper of the Stellar Group that I will not describe. Stay tuned for Vinicius, he's talking in, later in this section. I just want to highlight that they find the residuals which correlate with filters which we know to be sensitive to calcium, carbon, and magnesium. So there is a hint that something there, there is a signal there that we can explore. In terms of J+, we have more um, work already attempting to measure the atmospheric parameters. I gather three of them. If I'm missing one, please let me know. I don't want to miss anyone. We started by measuring um, temperature and iron abundance. We added uh, recently gravity and uh, the recent paper by Younger reports on measurements of carbon, nitrogen, magnesium, calcium and alpha. Um, I do have to say though that I'm not totally convinced that they are really measuring these elemental abundances. I will not explain why because I have to finish the presentation in 12 minutes, but if you are curious we can talk later. Um, the three work are machine learning with different approaches but all of them are machine learning. I, I'm not against machine learning, but I admit that I am more conservative, old school of thought. So I like to be sure that I see the signal there before I use this data to feed into a, a training. So my approach is back to basics. So I want to see the signal in the data. So I, I am modeling the stars, uh, the floods of the stars, for a grid of uh, temperature and gravity. And uh, I selected some chemistry beyond iron to explore. My motivations are the magnesium and oxygen I chose because they are alpha elements, which is largely used in galaxies. Carbon, nitrogen, sodium, and helium are very important to study global clusters, the phenomenon of the multiple populations. And calcium is a very strong signal. It's not uncommon when we cannot measure iron that we measure calcium instead. Uh, it's the second most uh, uh, strongest metallicity signal in stars. So these are the things that I am um, modeling. Um, results. So right now we have a grid of model stars, which in the coverage in temperature and gravity are the red stars here. The gray stars here, they are not real stars. They are two pointings of a galaxy model. So I use the three leg out to simulate what is it that we are going to see. So I just want to be sure that the grid can cover what we expect to see in real observations. Uh, the grid is sparse because, well, I'm varying lots of things, but this can be improved whenever needed, when needed. And uh, for iron, we have five different metallicities. For the other elements, we I adopt two extreme values based on what we know um, on archaeological studies in spectroscopy. The only exception is carbon. Um, uh, our carbon has more values than the other elements because as iron starts to go down, carbon starts to go wild and can be very high. And then there is a whole work on carbon enhanced metal two stars. So because of that, for the low metallicities, I added more points for carbon. So carbon has more points here than the other elements. First the thing is sanity check. First, I want to know if the models make sense. Um, so I hope that they fall wherever they are expected the stars to fall. So here I'm showing two color-color uh, plots to show the stellar Loki. In red are the model colors, and in gray are J plus DR3, a set of um, stars used by calibration that uh, Carlin has shared with me. I still have to improve in these comparisons because I didn't correct for reddening yet, but at least we can see that the models are following um, more sparsely, but they are following on the locket which are expected for stars. So this is good news. Once that is cleared, I would like to highlight some of the effects that I'm seeing. So now I am 
Uh, I gathered three examples to show. I'm fixing here the stellar parameters in this panel, only varying iron. And we can see, as we expected, a very strong effect, and iron effect uh, all the filters. So we see the iron signal everywhere, basically, in the stars. And here I'm comparing the carbon, which was a surprise. They didn't exactly know what to expect. But actually, carbon also has very strong signal, which is, is smaller but comparable to what the iron is, um, is showing. And uh, although it has some funny structures here, um, when the, the atmosphere of the model starts to be a bit crazy because of the carbon um, values. And uh, a more timid, let's say, signal is the one from uh, magnesium, where I'm showing here. I fix all the parameters, and then I have in red an underabundant magnesium, and then in a greenish an overabundance. So we have here, and here in this panel in the right, I have the difference in magnitudes of these two models. So with this, we do see the magnesium triplet, which we were expecting to see. It's an obvious uh, signal, and I'm glad we have it, although it still looks a bit small. This I don't know yet, I will discover. And I want to point out this effect here. So increasing the magnesium also increases, it produces an effect on the continuum, or, uh, which means the color of the star. And uh, this is not surprising. This has been known for a while. I just figured that it was important to point out that when we change the chemistry, we are not changing a line or a filter, we are affecting many filters and adding the generacies there. And um, it's very difficult for me while I'm still going through looking at this and, and building intuition to what is going on. Um, an idea that I had at least to give you a um, bird's eye view of what the chemistry is doing to, um, to the magnitudes of the stars. Here in the x-axis, I show basically wavelength. These are the narrowband filters in three pass. Uh, here I have the several elements that I'm varying. And then each bin here, the color will show the difference in magnitudes, which happens, uh, the difference in magnitudes, which happen for a given narrowband filter and a chemical variation. There's a lot varying there, unfolding temperature and gravity, unfolding a lot of things. Um, but at least the two things that we can get from here in a qualitative <laughs> manner. Um, if you notice that for the case of oxygen, iron, and carbon, they affect the whole, all the filters. So the signal is very spread and global. So we have some of this signal in many of the bands um, if we are, we are able to exploit this. For the case of the other elements, it's more localized, so we really have to look for where the features are, and everything happens in the blue, so the blue is getting very crowded, all the information in the blue, and we have to deal with the, the generacies. And uh, so I, am, I still want to do some comparisons with observations to be sure that there's nothing too odd with the models, although uh, the first, uh, my first setting to check the work though right, and we are soon getting to the point where we have to do the treasure hunt to see the signal. Just to have an illustration, here I am showing two color color plots with all the, the, um, the stars on the grid and color coded by um, element. And um, there are some ways of viewing this multi-parameter space where some of, the some of the chemicals will stand out. So this is an example where we can see carbon and we can see uh, oxygen here really standing away from the other groups of stars. So maybe there is indeed the signal there that we want to, to measure. And the next steps of this work, so for first and foremost, um, if you are interested in any part of the science, please talk to me. Uh, I like to know ideas, but it's more interesting to collaborate. On this, I, I hope to be able to identify which are the filters which are more sensitive to each of the, the, the chemicals, uh, the, the chemical elements, although we already know that actually some of the effect is continuum-like, so affecting a broad range of filters. And we will have to devise ways to measure this. Uh, suggestions are accepted. 
maybe uh, we are smart enough to choose colors like the HST case or uh, dimensionality reduction techniques or machine learning. Once I'm convinced the signal is there, I feel more confident that we can uh, use this to feed um, um, training uh, networks. And uh, that's it. So. Excellent talk. I saw that there is a question online. Uh, Simone. Simone, please go ahead. Hi, Paula. Thank you very much. Um, when you show this, um, the spec the J spectra with the um, when you identified some uh, features. Yeah. Maybe this feature at no the the other one yes. Maybe this feature at uh, 8,500 is, maybe it's uh, the calcium to triplet? Do you think yes, it's... it might be. The thing is that in theory, I'm only changing magnesium abundance. Ah. So I, in, in this comparison specifically, so mm -hmm. I, I, was expecting, okay. I wasn't expecting others to change, but it might be. Mm -hmm. And um, did you uh, look it up for barium, uh, barium two lines? I know there are some uh, some lines in barium stars that are too strong. Maybe uh, the the equivalent width may reach a um, thousand or eight hundred, something like that. So maybe I don't know if these features would be visible in the, in the J spectra. Have you tested for, have you looked up for barium chain? I didn't, and I didn't know that they were so strong. So let's talk later and uh, let's find out. Okay, great. Thank and you. Some... We do have uh, time for one more question. Sorry. Um, no, 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 please. You raise yes. your hand first. Uh, <laughs> I, I, do you check for lithium? And uh, would this be um possible to check well would these um simulations of your speech possible to check on mini jpas day um i did not check for lithium uh i think lithium is too small but maybe i'm wrong so that can be checked for sure and yes i would like to try this with the mini jpas data i understood that we have about 500 stars is that right so i needed to get the data and uh, Okay. Let's take again. Okay, now we have an online online talk. The, the rest of the talks will all be uh, online. So, John Aguilar, are you there? Yes. If you okay, great. Uh, you can share your screen now. Okay, okay, okay. Can you see me? Yes, yes, perfect. I'll, I'll interrupt you and let you know when you have two minutes left, okay? Thanks, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. I am John Aguilar, first year PhD student, and today I present a work title characterization of stellar atmospheric parameters with photometric colors uh, from J plus uh, to mass. Uh, well, uh, the principle for this work is to propose alternative forms to the spectroscopy uh, routines used to calculate the stellar parameters like temperature, gravity, and metallicity of main sequence stars. Uh, in this proposal, uh, we start by asking if photometry can have implicit information necessary to calculate these parameters. Um, in this way, various computational methods have been explored uh, with algorithms like linear regression, neural networks, and a method used in previous work of our research group. Uh, with uh, unsupervised uh, machine learning method. Uh, in this, uh, based on idea that 
the photometry of observed objects uh, for which uh, we wish to calculate the stellar parameters and reference objects that were uh, used for uh, comparison must have similar characteristics in their stellar parameters. Uh, however, uh, this idea implies determining how nearby should be the reference objects in this case, the comparison data to be a reference uh, for the estimation of a stellar parameter under a study. Mm, first, in our method, uh, we define a set of objects uh, with, uh, we will know photometry and stellar parameters that will be taken as calculation reference for objects for which we want to calculate the stellar parameters. Uh, among TC objects, we have synthetic models of so means project grid or single star stellar evolutionary models and photometry uh, taken from a sample of 30,000 objects published by Yang uh, with the J plus data release one, what you said, uh, calculate parameters star for this paper. Our interest uh, is to study objects uh, of type M of F, but uh, we have included objects that uh, are outside of uh, or study objects. This is uh, with the purpose of seeding that the method properly recognizes different types uh, of objects. Well, in total, what hundred twenty six thousand three hundred seventy five objects with no stellar parameters, and what hundred five colors constructed from J plus and two mass surveys survey events have been collected. Well, a second step in our method, we have proposed a test that tell us how our objects are grouped according to the behavior uh, to their photometry and their parameter, stellar parameters. For this, uh, we propose the Hartigan test, uh, which is to determine how many groups of objects uh, with similar characteristics are in our sample. This is a achievement to minimizing the, the dispersion within each uh, of the proposed groups. Uh, well, with the number of cluster defined, we apply commits for the first time to propose groups of similar characteristics, both in their photometry and their, their stellar parameters. Another Important result is that TC groups reveals uh, with the mean radius of frequency in the cluster that uh, we will later be taken as the neighborhood radius to calculate the stellar parameters. Uh, subsequently, we assign the objects uh, to which we wish to calculate the stellar parameters in the, the cluster indicated to phase uh, one. Uh, we proceed to see which objects are in the neighborhood radius, and we take them to calculate the mean value in the, of the stellar parameter that uh, we want to calculate, and it uh, standard deviation uh, as the error for this parameter. Um, with, with the stellar parameter calculator for each object, uh, we validate our, our, of, uh, our results by comparing them with the results obtained in other words, such uh, as those with Jang and Sprague and, and others uh, in the literature. Next, uh, we show the result of using this method and the calculation of stellar parameters for a set of 2,161 stars. Uh, uh, first, uh, the Hartigan test indicated that the comparison star group has a trend of uh, 20 groups, and TC20 groups, when implementing the Cummins, have similar characteristics, uh, especially in the stellar parameters. 
uh, we show this uh, with some of these cluster. Another important result is this phase uh, was to calculate the neighborhood uh, radius. Uh, with the groups obtained and the neighborhood radius defined, we proceeded to calculate the stellar parameters, temperature, gravity, and uh, metallicity. Uh, we see the diagram uh, in which these parameters will be calculated for a set of objects using two reference data sets. Now, when contrasting our results with those obtained in other scores, such as uh, those by Young, uh, Spring, and others, we denote that these results have a similar distribution to those obtained by our results. This routine show that the 105 colors build, build to conserve information in the stellar parameters on their study. But this has us another object, uh, which is to use a smaller number of colors. Uh, in this sense, uh, we saw that the reduction of dimension proposed by the principal components uh, analysis have an indication about colors that might be providing similar information as show by the three components and strengthening uh, when using this algorithm. Uh, Frontier, uh, it can be seen uh, that isolated variables are good discriminators and that um, accumulated groups of variables show a high correlation and therefore variables in TC groups can be omitted. Uh, Using this criteria, we obtain a reduction of what under five colors to 30 colors. Now, uh, we use our method with these colors and compare these results. Um, first, with a Hartigan test, we see that the, the number of group, groups tends to be the same for the two set colors. In this case, 20, 20 groups and additionality, uh, are a reduction to 27% of the time used before the standout. Uh, on the other hand, when implementing phase one with the 30 colors chosen as stellar parameters, we see that the characteristic of these parameters within each cluster and Maintained as show in the cluster temperatures obtained with the two set colors. Mm -hmm. uh, comparing the results of our, our estimation using the two set of colors, this yield similar distribution is shown in the plot. Mm, at, at this point, it is important to define if TC values are uh, absorb the, the question how good is the method? And in this way, we will quantify our results. Uh, for this, uh, we use the Van Alman plot that is used to analyzing the agreement in between two different uh, assays. Uh, in first case, uh, we compare our calculation with those reports uh, Bijang in his 2022 article, and if the temperature in an object calculated by two techniques are equal, then their difference should be zero. Um, in, in this case, uh, in zero line, in this case, a technique wa was used here in our work and other. Thanks. John? See? Yes? Sorry, uh, you just have two minutes left. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Uh, another three lines uh, that are calculated with the average, uh, the average plus or minus twist, uh, the standard deviation. Objects contained in this region have 95% uh, 
probability to being uh, reliably measuring it uh, when comparated to those reported big tank. We can see that that region of this plot as well uh, as the plots with the data from French and literature. High concentration of a result are close to a uh, different of zero. Um, uh, we check in how many tempers uh, are uh, in this region we comparing uh, them to TC3 data sets. We see uh, that it's about 94% we're calculating it with uh, any of the set colors. Uh, he can see the case along uh, the gravity and the case uh, and metallicity, the last thing we verified is the result obtained in metallicity. We, we see that the number of objects in the confidence uh, interval remains and the percentage similar to that of gravity. Uh, as my result, we find that using our method and photometry, the stellar parameters on the study can be inferred and that a subset of the 105 colors used to maintain this information implies a significant reduction in computational time. Uh, finally, we consider this reduction in time be, to be important in the calculation of stellar parameters for large, large data sets such as those of the past additionality without uh, retraining to achieve this, the reduction of the number of colors that will be used for this show be considered, considered uh, since, since around 2,000 colors are expected uh, from this survey. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John. And uh, firstly, do we have uh, questions in the audience? Um, yes. Okay, please. Uh, John, thank you for such a nice talk. Uh, I do have a question. Maybe I understood wrong what you said, but you're using the Jan sample and then you apply the canines and then you study the uh, the properties of the stars based on, on, on this sample. So my question, or this is what I understood, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, why not using directly the, spect the spectroscopy samples uh, that uh, were used by Jan, for example, instead of going to this sample that is coming from a neural network that was trained on these spectroscopy samples? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, we we use uh, the, the sample junk. Um, we use only the photometry. We we take uh, uh, two samples, uh, a sample to to algorithm to to camera to use in the camins and another um, sample to comparison. Uh, this is a uh, first uh, time we use the. the um, the sample of junk, uh, and this is the second time in we use uh, a second junk. All right, so you're using the catalog to basically apply the canines uh, over the stars. Uh, you're using it later for validation. Mm, excuse me, uh, I, I not understand. I was just saying that uh, then I understand that you use this catalog uh, to validate your results more than to train uh, your Camins model or anything like that. Um, in this case, uh, we use uh, a models uh, of junk uh, to train in our, our method. But in the future uh, words, uh, we want to uh, use other other. Uh, samples like uh, Lamos sample. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, a task to uh, can compare it with uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, data. 
to 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 do uh, contracts in in, in two samples. Uh, if I may complement uh, the, the 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 answer, the thing is that this sample is used also in the um, the the phase one, the K uh, means phase one, but uh, it was added just because the MIS um, models they did not have a good um, distribution of different yeah, metallicities. Of the, yes, the coverage the of metallicity. Of so the thing is that we have 70% uh, of the, the, the comparison data is uh, coming from MIST, but in order to cover um, a fine uh, distribution of possible metallicities, we added a 30% of this total to be uh, the, from the photometry from uh, J plus DR1. Right. So then, this is just a few objects from uh, this um, data set, but then we use the separate set of uh, objects of, of uh, data to the uh, for the validation phase. Okay, but it was just an artificial uh, solution or just a first um, attempt to solve the metallicity coverage problem. All right. Is, does that answer the yeah, yeah, question? Yeah, that I saw that there is a question online. Maybe we can uh, discuss later because we are running out of time. So let's uh, thank John again. Thanks. And now we will have uh, Vinicius Placo. Uh, hi, Vinicius. You can unmute yourself. Yes. Perfect. Uh, we do see your presentation. Again, I will let you know when you have once you have two minutes left. Okay, so you can start. Okay, sounds good. Um, thank you very much. Let me just do this and start my clock. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. I wish I could be there with you all perhaps uh, next year. So let me just close these two tabs here. All right, so uh, my talk today, I'm here just representing a really large group of people who have been working with this mini JPS data uh, and generated this really nice paper um, on stellar atmospheric parameters from the mini JPS data. Right? And I'm really glad that Paula gave this really nice overview about you know, archaeology of stars and galaxies, just because I think this here, getting the stellar atmospheric parameters is really the first step. Uh, into you know getting everything else right the chemistry and all. Uh, so I'll try to be very brief with the presentation. So this is the paper. It will be officially a 2023 paper as it was published now. So we are really happy. Uh, and again, I'm here just representing this great group of people. You know, Hi Bo, Lean, Patricia, Fran, and others who really work hard on this. So I'm just some sort of summarizing the results and trying to motivate our work within the star group. Uh, for when you know JPAS really becomes a reality. Um, okay, so two slides I want to show before I dive into the paper is that well, to me, a very good description of JPAS is just J plus on steroids, right? Uh, for stellar work, and I think this is true for for you know all the other groups. Uh, here I'm just showing some really success cases with uh, both J plus and S plus in terms of determining um, temperatures, surface gravities metallicities, and in this case here on the left-hand side, carbon abundances using photometry alone, right? Uh, some of those methods are machine learning, and I agree with Paula that sometimes, well, machine learning is all fine, but then sometimes going back to the roots and just doing color-color diagrams, as you see here on the top right side, also, you know, give you very nice results. And I think a combination of uh, those machine learning techniques with really domain knowledge, so you know what you're doing when you're selecting colors. Uh, I think this is also really important. Uh, this is just to motivate that, well, if we can do such good things with 12 filters, imagine when we multiply that by, well, almost a factor of five. So this is this is great, right? Once JPAS you know, has, has a larger some sort of an area, this will be really useful for us. For stellar work, I like to show the simulations here the top panels are just uh, synthetic spectra, and the, the, the bottom panels are your uh, JPAS SEDs, right? The left hand side shows uh, metallicity variation. So you see how the SEDs vary on the blue side. And on the right hand side here, you see 
different carbon abundances for the same parameter. So you see also there's a big dip here. So in principle, if you have good enough photometry, you can do this, right? Again, but we're really sensitive to the parameters and we need to be really mindful how we train those networks or how we do those color color diagrams. So JPEGs will be amazing for stellar work. However, mini JPEGs was really, 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 and I cannot emphasize this enough, designed for stellar work, right? I think this was as far away from stellar work as possible, again, by design, because it's such a small area. However, we really tried to do the best we could with the data that was given to us. Right? Within the, the, the mini JPEGs footprint, uh, paper zero here from Sylvia, we, we found uh, this really nice stellar sources. You can see that, again, you can really probe all you know, the Palmer features, molecular features with the JPEGs um, J spectrum. So this is great. However, the thing is we really need area uh, to do some particular work. So now diving into the actual mini JPEGs paper with the, the um, so parameters, this is what we had, right? We were really generous with the constraints. So magnitudes smaller than 22 in the R band and class star greater than 0.6. And we have roughly less than 3000 objects. If you do a cross match with the LAMOS DR7, you have 161 stars in common and only 10 giants. And with SDSS Segway, there's only 31 stars in common, right? And I really want to emphasize this um, because, well, 31 stars in common, right? There's probably more astronomers sitting in the room now than stars in the mini JPEGs footprint with actual spectroscopic counterparts from SDSS, right? Let that sink in for five seconds. And then <laughs> the fact that we, right? The fact that we got a paper out of it is just really, really amazing. So I cannot emphasize this enough that once we have a thousand times the footprint that we have now, I think we'll be uh, able to do great things. And here on the bottom is just, well, a, a nice image from, from the MEJ past. And you look, well, well, you have some stars in there, right? But then when you look at the detections here, this is what you get, right? Lots of red stuff. That's what everybody else is doing. And just a little bit of you know, stellar sources. So again, we really tried our best uh, to work with the data that we had, right? And also taking advantage of this Yang catalog with J plus, so we could also do some sort of a, a comparison and sanity checks. All right, so let's just dive into the paper. So, and again, uh, well, Patricia is there, so she was heavily involved and, and made some of these uh, with the Vosa CD, uh, SED feeding. So then well, questions will be directly directed to her. So this is just one example, a good example on the left-hand side and a bad example on the right-hand side. Uh, the, the red dots, these, this is the observed, uh, as far as I can, as far as I know, this is the, the observed uh, mini GFS photometry and the blue ones, this is the, the SED uh, feeding from POSA. Right then, so you see that the match, when you have good photometry, when you have accurate photometry, then the matches are pretty good. And in terms of getting temperatures uh, for that sample that I just mentioned on the previous slide, the bottom panel here shows what you have in terms of temperature. As you would imagine, then you have a good amount of you know, subgiant stars. You have a lot of you know, cooler stars in here. There were probably, you know, none of those would probably match with Lamost in Segway just because of the low temperature. But this is what you get just calculating the temperatures for those uh, sort of more accurate uh, fits. Right, so this is uh, one way of getting the temperatures and how those temperatures compare. For example, when you cross match with uh, the most here on the left hand side, and also cross matching with the Young et al. catalog for the stars that are in common between uh, the uh, S for J plus and mini J plus. So this, these are the temperature comparisons. Again, we don't have a, a really large dynamical range. Here we go from you know, 4,000 to 6,000 roughly in terms of effective temperatures. But still, you have very good correlations. There is some, some offset, some consistent offset of you know, minus 80, minus 90 degrees. But the, you know, the, the, the dispersion is not you know, terrible. But I think we, got a, we did a pretty good job here in determining the temperatures using this SED feeding 
machinery from Volsa, right? So this was some sort of the first step to get the, 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 the effective temperatures. Then in order to get the metallicities, one of the methods or the method that was using here was just uh, the stellar locus technique, a metallicity dependent stellar locus. So what you can see here, there are some constraints here in order to get a very nice sample of stars with confirmed metallicities from spectroscopy. And then what we did in this paper is just do this global two-dimensional polynomial fit in all of these uh, colors, usually narrow band color minus R as a function of T minus I. So then you have a polynomial that is metallicity dependent, and then you have all of those coefficients, and then you can apply that to your data with unknown metallicities. And here on the right-hand side, this is just showing you that for different metallicities, you see how for a given G minus I, how metallicity affects mostly the blue side uh, of, the, of your SCD, right? Most of the, the metal lines are in there. Um, so this is what we did. And then what you do is you just some sort of a vary your metallicity across this one dimensional space in metallicity. And you try to minimize this quantity here with, uh, with your uh, stellar locus technique. And you try to minimize all of these coefficients and your chi-square using different metallicities, and then you determine which one is the best metallicity for a given object. So the plots here show the metallicities calculated by, you know, just using mini j pass photometry as a function of the spectroscopically confirmed from the most. So you see here that for some of the stars with the lowest uh, chi-square values, the one-to-one -one relation is actually pretty good. However, again, I think only 61 stars. So we are going from metallicity solar to minus one. So this is not a really large dynamical range that you could capture all of those changes that are happening in the absorption features in the stellar atmospheres. But still, I think these results are really, really encouraging because we can see everything that's happening here, right? Um, also, something interesting that came out of this is that when you look at the error in the metallicity, I think this was just a multi color approach Two minutes, okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, you see that the error in the metallicity really scales with the error in the blue filters. You know, we knew about that, but this is yet another confirmation. Um, we could also cross match this with Gaia and you can do metallicity as a function of distance. And even though this is really sparse data, you can see that you know, fits our prejudice that as you go towards you know, larger distances from us, metallicity tends to decrease, right? Really preliminary. Something else that came kind of a for free when you do that is you can separate for the start that you have Gaia parallaxes, you can separate between giants and dwarfs, right? Calculating some sort of a, a absolute magnitude. And what we did was just run one of those XG boost uh, algorithms, separating giants and dwarfs. And what you see on the right hand side is just the feature importance for, well, your uh, absolute magnitude or your log G determinations because they're distinguishing between stars and giants, right? So as you see, you know, J510520 are the most important ones for log G. And I think we talked about this already in the server strategy. So if we wanna get log Gs and actually magnesium because the magnesium triplet is right there, these two filters are really important for those. And this is kind of the last thing that we got on the paper, just an extra thing. And since I have you know, 23 seconds, I'll just leave you with my takeaway messages. Again, JPAS can be both the science driver for many things in stellar work, but can also be a targeting machine. And we can talk more about this, but I think we have really good leverage in the way that we can select targets for spectroscopic follow-up. Uh, blue filters are really important. You know, good metallicity estimates depend on really milli magnitude level uncertainties in your blue filters, right? If you don't have that type of uncertainty, you're bound to be limited by, you know, it doesn't matter if you have 10 billion stars. If your error bars are not small enough, then your metallicity sensitivity is just buried in the noise. That, that, that's, that's what it is. Um, area is also important, right? If you want to do Godler clusters, stellar streams, and perfect dwarf galaxies. And just so you have a number in your head, if you want to find those really uh, fossil records with those metallicities below minus four, there's usually one of those for every 100 square degrees of the night sky, uh, 4G uh, magnitude 18. And the last thing I'll say is, well, our errors are just as good as one over square root of n.
just so we need you know statistics. And I'll stop here. Thank you. have time for a couple of quick questions so let's start online do we have questions online um cipriano i think you can just unmute yourself and ask uh, your question please no i don't have a question i was just teasing vinicius that everybody would have liked a, a larger area not only stellar people <laughs> yeah no and again it, by design and i think we, we made the best that we could with this but still more astronomers in the room than stars with spectroscopic counterparts. <laughs> Any other question? Vini uh, Alessandro here. Um, uh, assume that uh, we go faster with, uh, with the two bluest rays, would that be um, accept, would, would that be okay to find this uh, super Uber uh, met low metallicity stars, or for those you would need the whole 56 filters? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, again, speaking from my own kind of a niche here, is that a lot of the, you know, the filters above 5,000, if you want to do metallicities, they're really not really important in that sense, right? Because again, your domain knowledge tells you that the Blue filters have the most, you know, information about the metallicity, not the chemical abundances, right? But the metallicities. So if you can focus there, I think it would be really nice. Because again, we also learned that we already know how to get, you know, good temperatures from kind of any two distant narrow band filters, or if you have a good combination with one broadband, temperatures are fairly easy to get, reliable temperatures. So for the metallicities, and we show that with S plus, for example, that you, if you have a good combination of blue filters, you can do some pretty good uh, pre-selections. You know? So my own kind of self-interest and mode would be getting the, the blue filters first. You know? Okay, let's uh, please thank Vinicius again. Thank you. We have the last talk in the session, which is, it will be from Pedro Lopez. Pedro, are you there? Uh, hello, yes, uh, my colleague will present it for me because we are three students together. Uh, okay, great, you can now share your screen, please. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you know when you have two minutes left. Mm -hmm. So hello everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here at the JPS meeting. I am Eduardo Godoy and I'm presenting the first part of the talk together with my colleagues and uh, this great team of people. So the title of our talk is The Quest for Lost Globular Clusters, GCs in Three Nearby Galaxies with JPS. Can you skip it? Okay, so our background, uh, we are three undergrad students from the Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil's southernmost capital. And we've been working in this project for about one and one and a half years. So these are our collaborators. Hello everyone, my name is Pedro Foriano, and I'll begin talking a little about global Earth clusters. So GCs are a group of thousands to millions of stars gravitationally bound. Some of the oldest GCs are around 12 billion years. Uh, in our galaxy, we can resolve most of their stars individually, which does not happen for objects further away. Uh, and here we are interested in extragalactic GCs to use as probes to study their host galaxies. In the Milky Way, the metallicity distribution of global Earth clusters looks much like this. A uh, bimodal distribution with a peak of metal poor objects as shown by the blue bar and a lower peak of metal rich globulars as shown by the red bar. And in the middle, a few objects of intermediate metallicity. Uh, global clusters are present in most galaxies. Here you can see their presence in different types of galaxies. Uh, dwarf galaxies show zero to 10 globulars. 
spires like our Milky Way from 10 to several hundreds and the elliptical from hundreds to thousands of others. Uh, here's a video of one of the mosaic simulations showing the formation of a Milky Way like, like, uh, like galaxy. Uh, the globular clusters uh, are indicated by the color dots, uh, where the color indicates their chemical composition. Uh, over time, the merging of the central galaxies with uh, the smaller galaxy bring a large number of globular clusters. The age, chemical composition, and the orbit, uh, orbit of these clusters reveal valid information about the galaxy and where uh, the galaxy are they from. Oh, hello, I'm Pedro Lopes. And the majority of extragalactic GCC studies have been around uh, early type galaxies, like this one uh, in the image at the center of Hydra, where you can have up to 15,000 uh, point like sources, like this one outlined in white. GC systems, <coughs> sorry have been mainly uh, studying this type of galaxies for two main reasons. Uh, the, they have a large number of clusters and they're easy to extract the GCs from them due to a well-behaved profile. On the other hand, we have late type galaxies such as Spiral Neighbor Andromeda and the GCs are also heavily associated with the, their bulge, the halo and the strings of the galaxy. And this is the type of galaxies we decide to study. But GCs are not only found in the bodies of their host galaxies, but can also be found free floating in galaxy clusters, not necessarily bound to a certain galaxy. The Virgo, the Fornex, and the Able 1689 uh, galaxy clusters all seem to have a rich population of inter cluster GCs. This beautiful image from a Hubble Space Telescope in the slide estimated around 200,000 GCs in a single field. And here we have the first image of uh, JWST, where you can see so many little sources in the center of SMAX 0723, uh, a cluster uh, around uh, redshift 0 0.4. And this image shows uh, how the cluster was at uh, around 4.6 billion years ago. And on the, side in, on the side image, we can zoom in in the center and see a lot of uh, GC candidates highlighted in green. Uh, so, since the research are usually focused on elliptical galaxies, we decide to take a different path and study spiral ones, so we can have a different approach on this subject and contribute on this field. So, J plus is a great opportunity for us to do that and study those GC systems. And there have been already two papers on GC system using the J plus data. Uh, there have been two papers that did similar studies as our own that we used to help us with this project. One of them being from our advisor, Anakia Santos, and her collaborators, and the other was made with the help from Paula Coelho, who presented earlier in this event. Both of them showing how useful J plus is on the study of, G, uh, of GCs in nearby galaxies. So we are working uh, on three different nearby galaxies in similar environments to the one uh, in the M81 group. The first one, NGC 2403, is a spiral galaxy, and it's around three megaparsecs away from us. The second galaxy, NGC 4214, is, only, uh, is the only irregular in our sample, being around 2.7 megaparsecs. Uh, and the third and last galaxy, NGC 4244, is also a spiral galaxy, and it's the furthest of, this, of the three, with a distance of 4.5 megaparsecs. So as we talked earlier, we followed some steps from the paper about M81. So the galaxies we decided to work are within less than five megaparsecs away from us and in the same field as M81, which is locating uh, those in a, in a similar type of environment. And we will also like to say that there is one other galaxy, NGC 4236, that is starting to be studied by our group, which is above on the image. Uh, we plan our study uh, with these current steps in which some of them are completely finished and some of them are still in progress. We began using the automatic photometry from J plus uh, uh, to analyze the data. And then we moved to a sex, sex tractor photometry that we calibrate. And after that, we did a reddening map and once uh, we are done uh, and select our candidates, we will analyze it uh, via said fitting.
So in the beginning, we didn't have much experience on analyzing disease, as we said earlier, we are undergrad students. So for our first steps, we took the sample from J plus automatic pipeline, and we st uh, started working on it to see how uh, if we could understand how it worked. Uh, and we started making some color, color, and color magnitude plots to see how the objects were behaving around it until we reduced the sample from uh, 9,000 objects to 500. Uh, via cutting the data in various bands, colors, and with the help of Gaia's proper motion. And this final plot is on a ray deck with a class type coloring to see how the objects were distributed around the galaxy. But even if we achieve a certain result, it was not enough for us because we knew we were losing a lot of objects due to the objects uh, being obscured by the galaxy light. So we decided to create our own photometry via extractor, having now a more complete sample, and it was also designed for us to to help us find more like uh, uh, more DC like objects. But once we have the data, it's not fully fully ready to use. We must follow some steps uh, to see if the data is reliable. So we do the calibration from this extractor data, compare it to the already calibrated from J plus. When you do this process, uh, they give us uh, the zero point for the 12 bands. And here's an example for the R band. So to achieve a magnitude uh, more accurate as possible, we build in a semi-automatic pipeline that generates an extension map and also multiple tables based on the J plus filters. By doing so, we can uh, see and subtract in what regions uh, of our field we're having more light being absorbed by gas and dust. And as you can see on this map uh, for the NGC 2403 galaxy. We can skip it. Uh, another kind of analysis we are running on our data is the set fitting procedure, where we can study the physical properties of our objects, objects such as metallic, star age, and others, uh, just by looking at its spectral information. For that, we use the code Sigali, which, as you can see in the top right corner, has lots of modules for us to choose, depending on the type of data being studied. And just below that, we can see one example of set fitting of one of our blue RGC candidates. Uh, and beside the plot, uh, Sigali is also able to output the physical information about the object. And that's what we are going to use to describe our RGCs. Uh, talking about the NGC 2403, here on the left, you can see the object studied by Forbes et al with nine spectroscopically confirmed GCs observed with CAC telescope. And on the right, we can see the raw data taken from J+, and the color points being the match of the RA and DAC of the objects from Forbes. That way, we know exactly uh, which GC we are dealing with and its relative position to the galaxy every time you run any tests. So, since our project isn't close to being finished, we have a lot of work to do. But first, we must finish the calibration and the galactic extinction map uh, to create a clear sample and fully reliable. And then we will recreate the plots that we showed earlier uh, with this new set of data and we will analyze it. Once we have the uh, clear how the data is behaving, we'll set the parameters and select our GC candidates. And they will be analyzed by the method of set fitting and hope to find something interesting about them. Two minutes. Once the uh, once the study is finished for the three galaxies, we want to replicate it for the, the galaxies that resemble them. And uh, we work to create a complete census for GC systems in spiral galaxies up to five megaparsecs and stay tuned for that part. Uh, and we are looking forward to move to JPEZ at further distance and, and uh, 56 filters, which will be fantastic to work with. We thank you so much for your attention. Gracias e muito obrigado. Thank you all. So we do have time for questions. Are there any questions online? Okay. Maybe I missed it, but uh, why are you we obtaining the the, the 
the more precision or something? Yeah, we were losing uh, some some uh, points. Yes, yeah, some points. Uh, they were being lost, uh, specifically uh, near the Galact Center around it. Uh, as you can see in this array deck uh, map, uh, in the galaxy, in the yeah. left upper corner, uh, there is nothing much uh, there. And with, with this new uh, set of data from the extractor, we are uh, getting this data. So we'll be able to analyze a more complete sample and hope to find uh, more structures. Right, thanks. Any other question? Okay, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, have you tried the completeness uh, uh, of the of the detection method? So, for example, by inserting false uh, stars or false unresolved uh, things, and uh, within the galaxy, uh, which is uh, which is where sex factor is usually uh, very effective, uh, to just see hey, what effect uh, on the radius or maybe the the flux of the galaxy has on your ability to separate it or to deblend it from the rest of the galaxy, like a closer radii, larger radii. Yeah. yeah, I don't think we, we've tried that yet. That would but, be a good test. Uh, that would be a nice test to, to compliment. OK, thank you. thank you. We will definitely do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, more questions? I believe that everybody's already tired from yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's thank the presenters again. Uh, we are supposed to have three sessions with group meetings, but I don't know if that's happening. I believe not. It's not happening. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so let's prepare for. So, 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 <laughs> Please. Uh, we're not going to have today. Uh, science working group was cancelled for eating, preparing to eat. But uh, so tomorrow we start with this second discussion on the survey strategy. So while at dinner, uh, talk to your uh, group and so on, and, and let's see if we can brainstorm and try to focus on the, like uh, Alessandro uh, put it, you know, what's your crappy sandwich or something like this? You know, not just what is your best sandwich, but your crappy sandwich or crappy sandwich with some better spices, for example. If you go um, to a particular region of the sky and it has some synergy with somebody else that can bring science really fast in the first year, and it doesn't really uh, delay the <coughs> progress of the survey, that's a plus. Or like uh, um, um, Eduardo showed today, you know, we can go down, but we can, if you can act on that, then you can calibrate lensing, things like this. Uh, so that's maybe not the best, but something that can enhance the science that you do, especially in the, in the first year. Or science that can be killed if you go only with the group filters, for example, or not. So uh, tomorrow, I think it'll be good that the, the coordinators, we can start from this, present it. What are the options? Well, of course, we're not going to finish everything tomorrow, but it would be a great opportunity to have a brainstorming and discussion session on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, no. Good talk. Yes. I mean, uh, because it's uh, the beginning is one by one in the first year, um, we need to make a decision, as Alessandro pointed out, on restoring the original depth in the middle of the universe. Because if you don't, if you go with nominal exposures, that we lose half the magnitude, and we need to make a decision on this. Well, point six. Uh, maybe just, yeah, the, the, the question for me is still not clear. Like I pointed out before, the, the, the uh, one by one actually be. I'm sure it's going to start with one by one, from what I understood, and so you can correct me here. So this is a, a technical issue. Right? They can't. They may have solutions. Uh, that, and it's not even clear that. The fact is significant if you go to the narrow band trace, right? We know that in the, the broadband, that's a, a, an issue, this blooming or whatever it is. But it's not clear that for the narrow band, um, it's still an issue. So uh, I think it's one, one can always uh, say that if there is an issue and we go with one by one, right. we should increase the exposure. No. We should discuss. I mean, it's anyway overhead driven, as, I, as far as uh, I was yeah. explaining. 
uh, over in that. Correct. Yeah. But I think we should have a, set, a backup plan in case this, this is the situation. Yeah. Any more comments, suggestions? So, thanks. Oh,